It's the appreciator. Hi, it's Brett PQ. I'm wondering, listening back, since I moved everything around and set up the studio differently, is it me or is there more of like this reverb, ringy, overall sound happening? And is it good? Is it sound... I don't know. It sounds so different. I'm wondering if I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I'm so used to sounding a certain way and now I'm sounding this way and uh, at some point I gotta see because as it gets hotter the, the weather here right now uh, in contemporary time in case you're listening to these as they go along and not in some archive well it's it's getting hot we're gonna have a summer like we did in 2022 this year uh, I think we're going to have a endless series of days where it goes up to 100 degrees every day or more. It, uh, last year, I think it hovered at around 107, which is impressively hot. And I was running the air conditioner, but I wasn't being quite as critical about the sound and the presentation and that as long as I'm gonna do this I'm trying to be a little more measured in how I speak be a little bit more from the chest instead of the throat and from the heart as opposed to just rambling on and on because Frank can do both Frank can talk Frank Edward Nora the uh, leader and founder of the Overnight Scape Underground, where these shows originate. If you happen to be listening on YouTube, you know I am forever directing you to go and check out what goes on at onsug.com or look up Overnight Scape Underground on archive.org. There is, Frank is a master archivist, and we've all done so many shows. There have been many hosts that came and went come and disappear for a while and come back and this particular series this showcase this big appreciation showcase is where uh, I don't do the half hour monologue sh uh, driven show but I try to present things that I do appreciate and I think you might and if nothing else I don't know I have this idea that I'm preserving something or bringing something to your attention that you might not be exposed to. It's a nostalgia thing, as I'm discovering. And in general, I am a nostalgist with my memories and processing them, so to speak, aloud in this format. And this time around, we're going to continue our look at OnSug hosts and old radio and some other elements that I've used in different ways in previous series because I've done a zillion shows. Shambles Constant is a host that has been on and off on the Overnight Scape Underground. And I envy his ability to just flow and open his head and heart and just go with it. Jimbo used to call it the uh, shambles in a groove thing. I mean, he's, uh, he's a family man. He was a Vic and Sade man. And when we did the Vic and Sade casts with Jimbo, he was on quite a few of those with Jimbo. And he, he just does a much more personal vlog sort of look, which is what I feel like I'm moving towards as opposed to being or imagining that this is some sort of entertainment per se. In any case, I'm going on and on when uh, we're presenting here. This is the showcase and what I'm going to do is present some shambles constant from I believe, uh, let's take a look at the date here. All right, now I've got myself better organized. How the archive over at Internet Archive works, and this is going to be a very good resource. At a certain point, he started 
just going to the each month by month incoming shows. This is 901 uh, of the Unsug Radio Archive on archive.org. Incoming shows April 2016 that I'm kind of digging out of here uh, at the moment. And this episode is from March 16th, 2016. So what that's seven years ago, a little more than seven years ago. The title of uh, his series was Radio Free Shambles. I think he still uses that, if I'm not mistaken. And the title of this episode is Superhero Big Fat Zero. And we'll listen together and maybe I'll uh, do some commentary or something at the end. But uh, keep your ears peeled because, uh, as Jimbo would say, Shambles is in the groove. I just walked out of uh, Batman vs. Superman. (laughs) When I say I walked out, I watched a little over half of it and decided I was tired of it. You know, I um, I had decided not to go. But then this evening, I just kind of thought, well, you know, the critics are saying it sucks, but it's still making a lot of money, and its IMDb score is, uh, is more than halfway decent. So I don't want the critics to make up my mind for me. Let's give it another go. That's what I did, but <laughs> it is, oh, I couldn't sit through the whole thing. I just couldn't. It's a rainy night. Sunday night. At about 10 p.m. The showing was for 8.30. Of course they have like 10 or 15 minutes of previews first, right? But I still got through right about half half of the film. Maybe a little bit more. And for a superhero movie to have nobody that I'm rooting for (laughs) or even give a crap about. (laughs) That's not a good sign. There were only like four other people in the theater. It only cost me six bucks. So it's not like I'm out a big, huge uh, amount of money. I had to sit and listen to Jesse Eisenberg, the fast-talking Lex Luthor, who is a Lex Luthor who is also fast-talking. That guy? Oh my god, he's obnoxious. I like Jesse Eisenberg in most things that I've seen him in, like uh, And the Tour, um, Squid and the Whale, uh, stuff like that. But, uh, oh my god. <laughs> Just, I don't want to... Like, shut up! Shut up, Eisenberg! Stop freaking talking! And, uh, uh, Superman and Batman are on two opposing sides, and they're, they're both, uh, you know, killers. (laughs) So, like, I don't really, I don't care about either one of these guys. I really don't. Um, Amy Adams is hot. Um, she's, she's nice to look at, but that'll only take you so far. I should have gone with my original impulse and just not gone to see it, but whatever. And it has been so long. I'm not the kind that, that walks out of movies, and I can't even think the last time that I that I did, even for movies that I am not enjoying very much. Like, uh, oh, what was that one? D- Don't Be Afraid of the Dark or something? It was a few years ago. I think it had Katie Holmes in it. I'm not sure, but... Um, that was pretty lame, and I still sat through the entire thing. Just, uh, oh god, I, I just couldn't. I just I was sitting there, and I'm like, I have to go to the bathroom, and I don't think I'm coming back in. I was like, I cannot envision a universe in which I would finish watching this film. It is depressing. And and I like Bergman films. I I like Seventh Seal and. Wild Strawberry. I love Wild Strawberry. That's one of my favorite movies. But anyway, Wild Strawberries and uh, uh, other other movies that he did that I can't think of right now. Uh, but I cannot do this. So 
I am not going to finish it. I'm recording this on the night of uh, Sunday, April 10th, 2016. Um, and I guess I have a little more time on my hands than I thought I was going to have. My first impulse, I wanted to see something more comedic. It was basically just like uh, down to like The Boss, which is the latest Melissa McCarthy film, which those can go uh, kind of go either way. Uh, and I, I don't know. I loved uh, Bridesmaids. That was a really good one. And Identity Thief was okay. Uh, but uh, most of our other ones I can kind of go, eh, I can take or leave. So, yeah, I didn't uh, didn't do that one. And uh, what else? My Big Fat Greek Wedding 2. Um, eh, didn't feel like it. And, uh, oh, hell, I thought there was even, like, another comedy that I was looking at and kind of discarded. Then uh, Demolition, which is kind of a drama with... Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, where he's coping with the loss of his his wife. He seems to do that in, like, half of the movies he's in. <laughs> it's like his wife or his girlfriend dies. It's like the Moonlight Mile effect. And, uh, I don't know. And then that God is, God is Not Dead too, whatever. Um, no, don't think so. Really don't think so. Eye in the Sky, I already saw that one. Um... See, right now I'm looking at the posters to try to remind myself what else is out. But, eh, you know what? I gave it a shot. I gave it a shot. Like, I would have wondered otherwise. Like, uh, uh, I don't want the critics to... Uh, you know, and six bucks is all I spent. That's really not too bad. Six bucks, that's like a, a dollar for every 15 minutes that I saw, basically. And I can handle that. So, now I'm just kind of driving around. <laughs> and it started raining. I'm, I'm glad that I got out to my van before it started raining. So, uh, that was a good move at least. It'll be interesting to see if it's raining uh, an hour from now. Because maybe walking out of Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice early... Uh, it kept me from having to walk out in the rain. Or run out in the rain, actually. Because I'd have been running in this. Because my umbrella would have been in my van. I would not have had said umbrella on hand. So I would have gotten freaking soaked. And yet another weekend is almost in the books. I will have to go to bed get up in the morning and go back to work. Oh, God. Oh, I just want... I just want a little time off. I want a few days just for some me time and um, just to kind of chill and basically do my own thing. Record some shows and uh, watch movies and not have a care in the world. Damn, that would be good. That would be real good, actually. But we have been shorthanded at work, as I've been saying on earlier episodes of RFS. And uh, so I'm kind of uh, stuck <laughs> having to go in or else they're really going to be shorthanded. And like my conscience is... Uh, it, it speaks pretty loudly, which is kind of annoying. Uh, I don't know. I just don't know what to tell you. Or anyone else, really. I feel like I need to sneeze, but... I don't know if I have a sneeze. And I'm going to get home, and... My wife's going to be like, What are you doing home? Wasn't that movie much longer than that? <laughs> She sort of helped talk me into going because I said to her, uh, I says, uh, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go to see Batman versus Superman. I, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of weird 
because I was kind of dead set against it, but uh, but it, it's going to be long, though. I won't get out till about 11, and she said, oh, you would still be up at 11 anyway. It's not, gonna, it's not like it's going to keep you from uh, from sleep. I said, I, I know. So you should go. So, okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Annie. <sighs> oh, I don't know. Dang, it's a rainy night. Ugh. The good thing is that I, I already put casts in my van, so... Uh, I might as well mention on here that, because I don't think I have yet, that I will not be going to Wisconsin this year. Um, my wife and daughter will be going to Wisconsin uh, on our yearly... The yearly family trip with my in-laws, but I am going to be short on vacation time because we're planning on going on a Disney World trip later in the year, like in the fall, and I'm going to have trouble doing both, and so of course I will pick <laughs> the Disney World trip, and they, they will go to Wisconsin, I will stay behind, so... Which, I, I did that once before. I had to do that for similar reasons in 2011. And I have some recording from back then that I've meant to release. Maybe it'll go into a, a, a tapestry at some point. Because the tapestry episode that I just recently finished compiling has uh, some field recording from last year from uh, New Salem, Illinois. Which I think came out pretty well, but... I hadn't found a good outlet for it until um, finally I decided to just plop it into a tapestry in three separate parts. And I think it worked pretty well. I was listening to it earlier tonight. But, uh, yeah, I have some recording from July 4th of 2011. Uh, I went, I walked on the Constitution Trail for like three hours. It probably needs to be edited because I haven't listened to it for a long time and I, at the time I didn't plan to release it so there was some uh, personal stuff on there so I'll need to, yeah, I'll need to do some cutting on it. Then that night I went to, to watch the fireworks and I recorded some field recording which uh, originally went into a Friday Maze episode, and I don't know if I'm going to release the Friday Maze episodes on, on Sug. I just, I don't know if they're good enough, because I listened to the first one not too long ago, and I kind of cringed my way through it, like, because I just wasn't very good at this yet, and I, and then I kept calling myself Arthur Jazz, what the hell's that? Like, everybody knows my name's really Shambles Constant, what the hell? But Lord Jazz, <laughs> Um, I thought maybe I'll just uh, take out the the um, 4th of July fireworks portion and make that into a little field recording on its own and cut out any reference to Arthur Jazz and release it that way. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. So, do, 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 do. I'm also, I also have some other field recordings from an earlier vacation from 2013 that I am preparing for release. I'll leave it there for now. I don't want to, I don't want to jinx it by saying any more until I start releasing uh, portions of it because it it's going to be released in um, portions of roughly half hour in length each. I'll say that much. Oh man, it's raining. Ugh. It's just this, this spring sucks. All right. I mean, I know it could be worse, but it's just been gloomy and it's it's a depressive state of affairs. So I don't know. I I just uh, I want better weather than this. They're saying we'll probably go from from this straight into summer. Not really have any uh, 
happy, sunny, um, nice weather times for spring at all. But So whatever. I can handle summer okay. It's hot. I have some trouble with the heat. Um, I can't walk around naked all day, so... Or even part of the day, now that I think about it. I can't do that. So... Instead, I just kind of... Uh, stay in the air conditioning as much as I can once it gets above, like, 100. But I, I plan to go on some adventures this uh, this year. I want to do some adventures and record them and release them as Radio Free Shambles episodes. I think that'll be some fun. We're going to have some fun now. Tell you kids, look at it roll! Now we can watch Jackie Gleason while we eat. Quick, what movie? Quick, quick. Ah, you're too late. So, I'm driving along College Avenue now. There's not that many people out driving around. I felt like I could, I could uh, go on a drive. I don't know where I would go. I was hoping I would be able to go on an adventure today, but it didn't happen. Just, uh, there was too much to do at home. We had, we had some cleaning to do, and then my wife and I watched, uh, Saturday Night Live. We had two episodes to catch up on, so we saw the Peter Dinklage episode and the Russell Crowe episode. Both of them were okay, but nothing to write home about. The, there wasn't anything that really stood out in either of them as being, like, classic comedy material, necessarily. Your mileage may vary as to whether you find SNL classic comedy to begin with. Uh, the, 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 it's a show that I'm just gonna, I'm just always gonna follow. Um, whether it's it's good or bad, it's just uh, it's part of me, man. It's part of me. Uh, right now they're in a so-so kind of a state of affairs. Yeah, hey, they're working on Chipotle. The new Chipotle, which will be opening soon. Looks like they've got the counter built, and uh, there's tables in there and chairs. But they've got some work to do. Right next to it, in the same building, will be a pizza place called Blazes. Looks like they've got quite a ways more to go. I I'm wondering if, if uh, Chipotle bought their portion before... Blazes Pizza bought bought their portion, and I don't know if Blazes is a is a franchise or if it's just uh, like a, a like a one you know like a, just like a local pizza place that just is getting ready to open for the first time. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'll try it. Trust me, I will try it. Yeah, far be it from me to turn down a pizza place. And I like most pizza places. I even like Pizza Ranch, even though it's uh, it's kind of love it or hate it. It's like a it's like a buffet place that's kind of got a rustic style to it. Um, hence the word ranch, and uh, it's it's the pizza. I, I've heard some people at work say that they really can't stand it. Other people kind of like it. Uh, I you know I don't have too much of a problem with it. Uh, other stuff they have, they also have, like, in the buffet, like, chicken and, and biscuits and uh, different kinds of desserts and um, stuff like that. And uh, they have really good biscuits, too. That place has good biscuits, I, I, must, I must say. <sighs> so, I'm just exhausted. I don't know what my problem is lately, but I am so freaking exhausted. Oh! My family went, we went to, uh, we went roller skating yesterday, and it was kind of a disaster, <laughs> because none of us are very good. Like, I forgot that I was never good at it. Uh, my daughter has been taking ice skating lessons, and she's pretty good at that, but, uh, roller skating, uh, she has kind of more of a problem with, probably because she's more used to ice skating, and it doesn't completely translate over. Burger King's closed? That's weird. I thought Burger King opened... I thought they were open every night till like midnight. Well, they're closed, alright. 
it's a Sunday night, so yeah. And Annie uh, used to be a pretty good roller skater when she was a kid, and uh, it, I guess it's not necessarily like riding a bicycle in that sense. Uh, at least for her, she hasn't found it to be so. So, out of like the two hour event, we skated out there for maybe like five to seven minutes tops. <laughs> going around. I almost fell a bunch of times. Jackie fell once, and um, kind of she kind of got upset about that. Um, I don't know, but mostly I found that um, my side, like my right hip, um, I was feeling the strain pretty bad after like the first round. And uh, I, I was kind of disgruntled about that. I'm like, I should do better than this. Then after we left there, we went to McDonald's. Actually, we left early. We only left after like a little over an hour. But well, first, we watched. They they do some games out there on the on the the roller rink, like they did uh, limbo, and we bet on the winner, you know, like who was going to win. And, um, none of us got the actual winner, but we uh, uh, Jackie got closest. Then we went to McDonald's, and I was carrying the tray to the table, and they had, we had like two 10-piece orders of nuggets, and they were one stacked on the other, and the top one fell, and I lost half the nuggets out of that one. Like, so I was just feeling massively uncoordinated yesterday. So, I don't know. I'm just, oh, in a weird state of mind. It's kind of... It's kind of a carryover from the last episode. Remember when I was talking about how I felt like, uh, like I was not in reality? I sort of uh, feel like that still. Not sure what to do with that. But I don't know. What are you gonna do? Uh, I mean, I'm sure I am in reality. I guess. Actually, I'm not sure. It, it, it seems like I should be. This should this should all be real. I mean, I, I think if I were to just drive right off the road and run into a telephone pole, I think there would be a direct um, consequence of that. I don't think it's one of those where, like, uh, you know, it'd be like game over and then I'd start over again back at the movie theater. <laughs> um, coming out of uh, seeing Batman versus Superman and bitching about it all over again. I don't, you know, it wouldn't be like that. It would be more like wake up at the hospital or some sort of crap like that kind of thing. Oh, man. I don't... I really don't want to work tomorrow. I really, really, really don't. I could... I could call in, but... And it wouldn't really be that much of a lie if I said... You know, like, they don't have... Like mental health day necessarily where you can call and say, you know, my mental health is uh, out of whack. I'm, I'm mentally sick right now. Not like mentally ill. It's not to that extent. <laughs> I do have generalized anxiety disorder, so that's sort of a mentally ill deal. Sort of. But, and depression, yes. But it's not like mentally, it's like, it's like, I just need a day. It's like the mental flu. But no, they don't. They don't have that. They just uh, you have to, you know, be like, I have a headache, <laughs> and that they'll take seriously. But if you you call in and say you're depressed and you just need a day, that doesn't really fly so well. So I don't know, whatever. And by the time I get to that point, usually I have a headache anyway, so it doesn't. So I'm not lying. I just don't want to have to actually give myself a headache in order to not be lying about it. I don't know. It, it helps a lot to be able to, to listen to uh, on-sug shows while I'm working on my headphones. Um, that, that helps uh, a great deal. Because I got through... Well, I've been listening to the, the newer episodes whenever they're not blocked. Like, about half the time at work... I'll come up with like this. It'll hit a firewall and say that, uh, you know, like onsug.com is blocked. 
But then if I do, if I go to the feed, it's fine. It comes up. Or the other way around, if I go to the feed, it's blocked, and then the regular site is fine. Uh, the other day they were both blocked, so that, when that happens, if I want to listen to on sub shows, I have to go to the Internet Archive and listen to some of the older ones, because I've never run into a situation where where archive.org is blocked. So that's that's a good thing. Let's turn this off. It's getting hot in here. But... Uh, I don't know though, um, but I I, uh, I listened to the whole first patch of um, Bug Out, which is uh, an old series of PQ River um, of his uh, creation, which I would definitely um, recommend. Uh, go listen to Bug Out, or uh, then then after that I listened to um, Frank Edward Nora's uh, Day One. Um, his uh, original foray into actually using the words overnight scape underground and like um, it was a, a series of pieces of audio that amounted to 24 hours by the end of it uh, and uh, it had like music and so it was field recordings and uh, soundtrack to like movies and stuff and uh, just a lot of really great stuff in it and he did five of those like in day form uh, before it became the Overnight Scape Underground as we know it today. And uh, but that was that was I really enjoyed that and I listened to that through like the Pocket Overnight Scape patches which I really like. Um, although I know he's organizing the audio differently now with uh, this Onsug radio which I'm not quite sure how that's going to work but um you know, I'm going to trust that Frank knows what the hell he's doing. Because he does. Um, he really does. He, he's, uh, he invented this whole thing, basically, uh, with some inspiration from uh, Gene Shepard. You know, shows that he listened to of Gene Shepard and like that. But uh, from that, he's really revolutionized the whole uh, uh, monologue show radio format. So anyway, I guess I'll go home, and I will, what do I want to do? It's not really raining like it was, let's see, can I turn the wipers off? Let's see how that works. I'm near home now, I've just been kind of driving around a little bit. There's one of the Constitution Trail entrances right there. I haven't walked on that in a long time, maybe I should. But I would love to just take a day off and just go on adventures and record. One of the things I want to do is uh, go to all the uh, um, historical sites in a given county. Like, uh, look online, like on Wikipedia, all the historical sites in Logan County, which is where um, it's, it's near McLean County where I live. And then maybe like Sangamon County, but like there's a there's so many of them in Springfield. I don't think I could do it all in one day. That's sort of an inspiration off of uh, Frank's uh, Tapa Mall project that he did a long time ago, where he uh, he went to a certain number of malls every day and like and touched each mall. <laughs> and uh, see, I, I kind of feel like a lot of the things I do are based off the thing off of things that either Frank or PQ have done. Um, just to kind of give it my own spin. I'll be like, maybe if I do this sort of thing, I was like, well, that is kind of like something that, that one of those guys did. And so, so, I don't know. Maybe I'm being too hard on myself on that. But, anywho. Uh, yeah, we'll probably just call this a show. Um, it's a show. And uh, not a really long episode, but it doesn't have to be. Um, a lot of these have been about a, a half hour long. And, uh, that's that's a pretty good little length for uh, just kind of a just kind of dipping my toe in the pool, the night pool, I guess you might say. And uh, it's not that big a deal. Let's see, actually, how far did I get here? Twenty-eight. Yeah, that's just about perfect. Maybe I'll record some more this week. Uh, there will not be. Uh, any Love and Abner showcase during the the, the week of uh, 
the what would it be the that's a, 18th to 22nd like that week and normally I would do them on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays but uh, I will not have any episodes come out that week but it'll start up again the following week so just to tell you that oh my gosh shamblesconstant at gmail.com if you have any comments or questions or answers or snide remarks anything really just go to shamblesconstant at gmail.com shamblesconstant at gmail.com uh, if you want to send in some audio I, I'll play it um, that's just kind of where we'll go on that yeah, see it's now it's got to be about 10.30, 10.45 let's see 10.47 p.m. Boy, is my wife going to be surprised to see me or what? Answer, yes. And yes, uh, to, I note right away, I forgot that he had done the Lumen Abner series. Lumen Abner was sort of similar to Vic and Sade, an old-time radio series that was like a serial where stories would go on. And it was much more episodic, and things progressed as they went along, whereas Vic and Sade is more just this, like, snapshot and pastoral without very much progression, per se. But the Lumen Abner show, uh, this something he really loved and glommed onto, and, uh, I, I like that he talked about, like, the Bug Out series. I, I forget about that because it didn't run as long. It became... Well, it's basically the same show with a different name. Uh, Bug Out evolved out of Night Project and Bedcast, which became the pop culture QD, which became the Quake Reversal Satellite, which is probably, as far as time, the longest-running PQ River Brit show up that I was just PQ River then and now I'm transitioning this whole thing is changing and I, I want to be more of Brett and less bombastic and showy and just do this I mean and and talking about Nora's older works and and, and I like that I inspired someone that's kind of flattering but I never felt that shambles was like copying me or emulating me uh, he puts his own spin on things, and I really like... I mean, he's, I think, the only one on the onsug. I mean, Eddie, who we haven't spoken about much because... Well, he hasn't done a lot lately, so then to, out of sight, out of mind, out of earshot, out of mind with me. And lately especially, I have this different cluttered brain than my usual cluttered brain. Um... And the things he talks about, I mean, his life, it's more like, like I say, a vlog, so to speak, uh, than what I've been doing. But I'm moving more towards a vlog. Um, I never saw that Batman versus Superman. And I walked out of Doctor Strange, just not that I, what I do is material here, but that he walked out of it makes me less apt to want to see it. Um, I was curious about it. As as you know, I'm a comic book guy, and that sort of thing has an appeal to me. And I'd probably like it. But I don't know. In a theater, it's different. And in a theater alone, I have never been one to go places and do things by myself when I don't have a friend or a significant other to do things with. I seem to kind of just seal myself off from the world it's that having someone to share it with if not report right back at the end of the day to about it takes some of the joy and purpose out of things hmm and, and, and briefly mentioned Jackie Gleason I'm really curious because while he's not like a young kid I mean, compared to me, maybe. But uh, his impression as somebody who's far more progressive in his thought and far more of a sensitive soul, the bombastic Jackie Gleason, 
Uh, I've had friends who can't watch Jackie Gleason because of the way he yells and hollers and treats his wife Alice and the honeymooners I, is what I think of and I think most people think of when they think of Jackie Gleason because that's what he's most famous for. He did other characters on his show, but everybody watched for the honeymooners really. And, and roller skating. But like a family, that really sounds like a nice thing, except as he says, for the falling hazard. And uh, Shambles, he, he comes and goes. He's one of those people who will suddenly stop broadcasting for months at a time and then come back and do a whole bunch of things. And he also does a show that's very much like this, where he showcases things that he's found that he finds interesting, but he just presents it without the commentary part for the most part. And perhaps as uh, on this very showcase, I should include one of those just so we get to know Shambles a little better. And like all of our hosts here on the Overnight Scape Underground that I talk about, there's a huge archive. Shambles has done hundreds of shows for the Overnight Scape Underground. So it's, it's, the world is open to you. Shambles, all of these hosts that I present here, there's a plethora of listening if you find that to your liking and yeah that's what the showcase is we're bringing you things that i like and appreciate because as you, you know the shtick i don't need to belabor that let's just continue here as is a staple on the program i want to smile again and, and join me in smiling again at radio's home for Smile again with radio's home folks. They can say written by Paul Riley. Tony, now I'll have it all done and can have the evening free for other activities. Moving picture show, huh? Big pardon? I think you turn off that school book afternoon for show. I'm afraid I don't grasp the connection. <laughs> you come home from school of an afternoon and sit yourself all fancy and important at the library table with your algebra. Then after supper, you give us a spiel about how you've got your studying all done and would like to take in the bio. Why, what a fantastic notion. Yeah. Sometimes, Mom, I greatly fear you have a strain of suspicion in your Here's makeup. your father home. Hi. Is that my daughter, Teddy, who spoke? Yeah. I go. And now it's my daughter, Russ, speaking. Good humor. Uh-huh. Here's a good movie on it, the bio, now that you happen to mention it. Huh? Gloria Golden and four-fisted Frank Fuddleman and... Take this throbbing heart of mine, assistant Starboard Williamson. Uh, my darling city is my darling rush. It is heaven on earth to see you once again. Your Cam Hank got stopped, get a hold of you? Yes. Weren't you in your office this afternoon? You telephoned three times. I was in the boxing department checking over some materials. I didn't mention to Miss Hammer Suite where I was going, so I expect she assumed I'd gone home. Uh, where are we eating supper tonight? How'd the kitchen table be? Kitchen table? Where do we generally eat? Oh, yeah. That was a foolish question. Uh, reason I spoke, how do you people like to have Papa take you out for something? Fine. What's the idea? Well, I just as soon treat you guys to a restaurant meal, and in doing so, I'm doing a favor for a friend. Can't let stop? Yeah. What's the angle this trip? <laughs> By George Mom, you talk just like the kids at school. Well, I pick up slang off of you. Catch myself talking funny in front of the Thimble Club ladies sometimes. Uh, What's old Hank got up his sleeve this trip? Hank, you'll be pleased to learn. There's a job. Again? You know a Mrs. Arthur Grace? No. She's the lady who recently opened up the restaurant there on the corner of Monroe and Madison Street. Oh, where you went with Mr. Boar? The same. What's the name of it, Harry? The little tiny something or anything? The little tiny petite pheasant feather tea shoppy. Yeah. Hey, you got to stop working there? Mrs. Grice is employing him on a temporary basis. However, if he makes good, she intends to offer him a permanent position. <laughs> What's he do, Gov Cook? He is... <laughs> host. <laughs> what? Hank is host. Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah, I knew it was going to laugh. I bet Hank is the prettiest hostess in town. <laughs> I knew it was going to laugh. Ah. The term hostess is just a name. 
Actually, Hank is the official greeter for the little tiny what you do. The little tiny petite peasant belly tea shopping. Yeah. Hank will accost Patrick and the patrons at the door and bid them good evening, take their wraps, and escort them to their table. They only got three tables. You have eaten there, have you, sir? No, but Bluetooth Johnson and myself peeked in the window the other day. They only got three tables. If the establishment flourishes through the efforts of Hank and business starts booming, Mrs. Grice may expand and have ten tables, twenty tables. Well, why don't this Mrs. Grice be her own hostess? She has only two hands. How do you mean? She cooks for the food and serves it. That's enough to keep any one person busy. Uh-huh. Hank, in addition to his duties as hostess, will present the customer's bills to him and collect the money. Also, he'll hover around and inquire if people find everything okay, isn't the soup delicious, and all such junk as that. He'll lend tone and color to the joint. I'll say. When his finances allow it, he plans to acquire a swallowtail coat and striped pants. I never thought I'd see the day when Hank Gustav would turn into a hostess. A hostess in a tea shop. See, the times I generally run across him, he's either sleeping on the Illinois Central Railroad Station platform or sleeping in the courthouse yard or skulking out in front of the Lazy Hours pool parlor. And here he is, the hostess at the little tiny petite bed and feather tea shopping. The ugly duckling has turned into a swan. Yes, indeed. Well, shall we go there this evening and eat? <laughs> All right. Fine. I bet we enjoy a delicious supper. Well, will uh, us go in there and help, Hank? You bet your life. His real function at the restaurant, as you may have divined, is to bring in business. He hopes to bring lots and lots of people into the tea shop. If business uh, booms, why, Mrs. Christ will pay him a salary. Salary? Yes. What's she paying him now? Uh, meal. Oh. <laughs> she gives him his meal, see. Uh-huh. If Hank is successful in building up patronage, she'll receive good hard cash. When does he start to work, Doug? It starts today. We will be among his first customers. Seeing room for many customers, only three tables. Who knows? The day might come when that restaurant boasts 20 tables. <laughs> be awful darn crowded. If we do... Go eat there this evening, Vic. Yes. Oh, we won't have to come around with that, Hank, will we? We'll meet him in his official capacity of hostess, is all. He'll greet us at the door, perhaps shake hands, bid us good evening, seat us at a desirable table, put our napkins in our laps, take our order, and generally make himself affable and pleasant. Well, I don't like the man, and I don't want to come around with him. <laughs> You don't chum around with the head waiter of the Butler House Hotel, do you? Uh-uh. Hank will be as discreet and tactful as the head waiter at the Butler House Hotel. He will hover about us while we eat and nod and smile and be on the alert to do your bit. Some more ketchup, Miss Gunn? Yes. Do you find difficulty making any salt come out of that salt cellar, do you, sir? I'm afraid it's the damp weather gums it up. One moment, please, while I run to the kitchen and fetch a salt cellar where the salt really comes out. Hold on there, Miss Gook. Let me wipe the gravy off in your chin. My, what pretty blue eyes. Do you think I'm a nice hostess? Darn this shoe of mine. Look at it all untied. Well, I guess I'll go get a shave and air it. Well, it's supposed to be witty, ain't it? <laughs> Just imitate Nan Gustav is all. Well, don't imitate Nan Gustav anymore, please, Rush. He's a good boy. Mm-hmm. How much is the meal that's a little tiny feather to weather? 35 cents. That's a set price that pays for a set dinner. Everybody eats the same thing. See, the establishment is extremely modest and operates on quite a small scale. Until business flourishes, they can't offer their patrons as much variety. For your 35 cents, you get soup, meat, potatoes, beverage, two vegetables, salad, and dessert. Mrs. Greisheim tells me is an excellent cook and her food is very tasty. Uh-huh. And here's another thing. A person reflecting on the name Little Tiny Petite Pheasant Feather Tea Shoppy might be inclined to feel that their servants would naturally be small. Yeah. You think a dinky thin sandwiches with the crust cut off and teeny little hunk of pineapple with a cherry on top and coffee cups about a third the size of regular coffee exactly. cups. Exactly. But Hank tells me the servants at Mrs. Grant's place are quite substantial. Uh, well, he won't be eat with us or anything, will he? Who is it? Hank. Eat with us. Well, I was thinking that as long as he's working for his meals and... Here come along some friends of his that he's enticed into the restaurant. He might collect his pay right there on the spot and tell Mrs. What's-Name to slap the meat and potatoes oh, on the table. Oh, 
Well, I wouldn't put it past him. Sadie, Sadie, Sadie. I wouldn't put it a bit past him. I think we, don't, we can rely on Hank's tact and discretion. Hank got to stop our hostess. You can use the term official greeter if it strikes you as more suitable. Well. Yeah. Uh, you must wash your neck before you go out to dine this evening, Rush, my boy. My neck's okay. There's a suspicion of griminess, I fear. No, Vic, I just as soon go and all. In fact, I want to go. I'm interested in tea shops. But if I thought I had to chum around with that old Hank... You I... won't have to chum around with Hank. You will meet Hank only in his official status as hostess. I guarantee... Stop that one thing, Stop one thing. Yeah, will you, Willie? Most likely it's good old pain in the neck. You take Frank Papp and I'll take vanilla, reliable Bluetooth chances. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Yes, I believe he is. One second. Like me, sir? Thank good stuff, I think. I could hear billiard balls clicking around. Okay, one side. Thank good stuff. Hostess at the little tiny petite bed and feather t shirt. Hello? Oh, yes, hey. Oh? What do you mean? Well, what happened? Oh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I see. Well, okay, Hank. Yeah. So long, Hank. <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> what are we going to have for supper? Supper? We're eating here at home. Are we? Yeah. Hank, what are the hostess business? He has severed connections with the little tiny petite pheasant feather tea shoppy. Or perhaps more correctly, the little tiny petite pheasant feather tea shoppy has severed connections with Hank. He have a quarrel with Mrs. What's her name that runs it? Words were passed between them, Hank, you may understand. Uh uh-huh. Uh Hank got ahead of himself. Oh? He was working for his meals, you know. Uh huh. Today was his first day. Yes. It's not yet five o'clock and already Hank is Yes. Eating six meals. My land. It's not yet five o'clock and already Hank has eaten six meals. Goodness. His grace felt that it was an unprofitable setup for herself and her rescue. Well, I should hope. So, Hank Gutstop is no longer hostess at the little tiny petite pheasant that is tea shopping. Uh. Hank Gutstop is no longer hostess at the little tiny petite pheasant that is tea shopping. Oh man, Hank Gutstop, the character spoken about in this episode of Vic and Say throughout the existing episodes, because Vic and Say, there's probably only about 300, 350 episodes, and they did 300 episodes a year for like 12 years, so what, one twelfth of the episodes, and the really early ones don't exist at all. It's mostly 40s ones with a few 30s ones. Hank Guts Up is the ultimate ne'er-do-well, and Sade does not like him, obviously, because he always leans on his buddy Vic for money that never seems to be paid off. Uh, I mean, they don't do an ongoing accounting, but you never hear in an episode that he ever paid back any of the money. Vic makes him a member of the Sacred Stars of the Milky Way, and he's always mucking that up. He's just not a good friend. And Sade does not like that. And you can hear that the character, the acting in this is just delicious, because you can tell she does not like him in any way. She doesn't want to be in the same room. She doesn't want to associate with him. It's kind of funny. And I can't wait till AI fixes these because I had to skip. I recently, as I told you, downloaded probably what is the highest quality version of the complete Vic and Sade files, thanks to Ted Davenport. You look him up. He is a OTR dealer, old-time radio dealer, and I guess he's decided to put most of his collection in different places online and ask for you to pay what you will, even if it's nothing. So if you get curious about old-time radio, you want to deal with a legit guy with really high-quality stuff. Granted, um, I had to skip, what, three, four files, but a lot of the Vic and Sage shows exist, and that's the only way they exist. 
AI now, they say, can fix old stuff. I've heard some restorations. Paul McCartney is releasing a new Beatles song. And that's going to be exciting. I hope. Uh, as you heard, uh, the ones they did, what, 20 years ago, Free as a Bird, meh. But maybe this is a good John Lennon song, that indeed the recording was just too lousy and they can fix it now. And then there's the tiny, petite, pheasant, feather, tea shoppy. Ah, would you go eat there? It sounds like a really pleasant place. And it does show up again and again in the existing episodes. So, as our... Well, we may even hear from Jimbo. I'm pretty sure we will at some point this particular program. And continuing my fascination with the stuff of the 20th century, let's go a little earlier to almost the turn of the century and get literary for a little bit. There was a movement in literature called naturalism, created, uh, or uh, seemingly created by Emil Zola, who's even more famous for the Dreyfus Affair these days. But he wrote many novels and was very infamous for, instead of writing about idealized people and royalty and the rich, the regular people the normal people. And one of his most famous books is McTeague, which I came to know about when I was a fan of Eric von Stroheim, a maker of silent films. Von Stroheim liked this idea of the human beast, that humans are imperfect, and he got to film his favorite book, and what was released is known today as Greed. Originally, he literally filmed the whole book, from what I understand, and they just chopped the movie down to uh, what we have now is a little over two hours, but the original film was about seven or eight hours, and it's one of those legendary things and unfortunately, by the time anybody had any great interest in it, anybody who had seen that original version was dead or had vague memories. Kind of like that Jerry Lewis movie that I think this year we're finally going to see or next year, The Day the Clown Cried. But what I have now is chapter one of the original Frank Norris book, McTeague. I found an audiobook version, and LibriVox, as I have done in other shows and said, is an incredible resource for books published before 1925. Public domain stuff that volunteers read, hence, you get a free audiobook version, and some, meh, the reading is not so good, although over the years, They've gotten better readers, and people are a little more conscientious. In any case, let's check out McTeague, Chapter 1, by Frank Norris. Chapter 1 of McTeague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. McTeague, by Frank Norris. Chapter 1. It was Sunday, and, according to his custom on that day, McTeague took his dinner at two in the afternoon at the car conductor's coffee joint on Polk Street. He had a thick gray soup, heavy, underdone meat, very hot, on a cold plate, two kinds of vegetables, and a sort of suet pudding, full of strong butter and sugar. On his way back to his office, one block above, he stopped at Joe Frenna's saloon and bought a pitcher of steam beer. It was his habit to leave the pitcher there on his way to dinner. Once in his office, or as he called it on his signboard, dental parlors, he took off his coat and shoes, unbuttoned his vest, and, having crammed his little stove full of coke, lay back in his operating chair at the bay window, reading the paper, drinking his beer, and smoking his huge porcelain pipe while his food digested, cropful, stupid, and warm. 
By and by, gorged with steam beer, and overcome by the heat of the room, the cheap tobacco, and the effects of his heavy meal, he dropped off to sleep. Late in the afternoon his canary bird, in its gilt cage just over his head, began to sing. He woke slowly, finished the rest of his beer, very flat and stale by this time, and taking down his concertina from the bookcase, where in weekdays it kept the company of seven volumes of Allen's Practical Dentist, played upon it some half-dozen very mournful airs. McTeague looked forward to these Sunday afternoons as a period of relaxation and enjoyment. He invariably spent them in the same fashion. These were his only pleasures, to eat, to smoke, to sleep, and to play upon his concertina. The six lugubrious airs that he knew always carried him back to the time when he was a carboy at the Big Dipper Mine in Placer County, ten years before. He remembered the years he had spent there trundling the heavy cars of ore in and out of the tunnel under the direction of his father. For thirteen days of each fortnight his father was a steady, hard-working shift boss of the mine. Every other Sunday he became an irresponsible animal, a beast, a brute, crazy with alcohol. McTeague remembered his mother, too, who, with the help of the Chinamen, cooked for forty miners. She was an overworked drudge, fiery and energetic for all that, filled with the one idea of having her son rise in life and enter a profession. The chance had come at last when the father died, corroded with alcohol, collapsing in a few hours. Two or three years later a traveling dentist visited the mine and put up his tent near the bunkhouse. He was more or less of a charlatan, but he fired Mrs. McTeague's ambition and young McTeague went away with him to learn his profession. He had learnt it after a fashion, mostly by watching the charlatan operate. He had read many of the necessary books, but he was too hopelessly stupid to get much benefit from them. Then one day at San Francisco had come the news of his mother's death. She had left him some money, not much, but enough to set him up in business. So he had cut loose from the charlatan, and had opened his dental parlors on Polk Street, an accommodation street of small shops in the residence quarter of the town. Here he had slowly collected a clientele of butcher boys, shop girls, drug clerks, and car conductors. He made but few acquaintances. Polk Street called him the doctor, and spoke of his enormous strength. For McTeague was a young giant, carrying his huge shock of blonde hair six feet three inches from the ground, moving his immense limbs, heavy with ropes of muscle, slowly, ponderously. His hands were enormous, red, and covered with a fell of stiff yellow hair. They were hard as wooden mallets, strong as vices, the hands of the old-time carboy. Often he dispensed with forceps and extracted a refractory tooth with his thumb and finger. His head was square-cut, angular, the jaw salient, like that of the carnivora. McTeague's mind was as his body, heavy, slow to act, sluggish. Yet there was nothing vicious about the man. Altogether he suggested the draft horse, immensely strong, stupid, docile, obedient. When he opened his dental parlors, he felt that his life was a success, that he could hope for nothing better. In spite of the name, there was but one room. It was a corner room on the second floor over the branch post office, and faced the street. McTeague made it do for a bedroom as well, sleeping on the big bed lounge against the wall opposite the window. There was a washstand behind the screen in the corner where he manufactured his molds. In the round bay window were his operating chair, his dental engine, and the movable rack on which he laid out his instruments. Three chairs, a bargain at the second-hand store, ranged themselves against the wall with military precision underneath a steel engraving of the court of Lorenzo de' Medici, which he had bought because there were a great many figures in it for the money. Over the bed lounge hung a rifle manufacturer's advertisement calendar, which he never used. The other ornaments were a small marble-topped center table covered with back numbers of the American system of dentistry, a stone pug dog sitting before the little stove, and a thermometer. A stand of shelves occupied one corner, filled with the seven volumes of Allen's Practical Dentist. On the top shelf McTeague kept his concertina and a bag of bird seed for the canary. The whole place exhaled a mingled odor of bedding, creosote, and ether. But for one thing, McTeague would have been perfectly contented. Just outside his window was his signboard, a modest affair that read, Dr. McTeague, Dental Parlors, Gas Given. But that was all. It was his ambition, his dream, to have projecting from that corner window a huge gilded tooth, a molar with enormous prongs, something gorgeous and attractive. He would have it some day. On that he was resolved. But as yet, such a thing was far beyond his means. When he had finished the last of his beer, McTeague slowly wiped his lips and huge yellow mustache with the side of his hand. 
bull-like, he heaved himself laboriously up and, going to the window, stood looking down into the street. The street never failed to interest him. It was one of those cross streets peculiar to western cities, situated in the heart of the residence quarter, but occupied by small tradespeople who lived in the rooms above their shops. There were corner drug stores with huge jars of red, yellow, and green liquids in their windows, very brave and gay. Stationer stores, where illustrated weeklies were tacked upon bulletin boards, barber shops with cigar stands in their vestibules, sad-looking plumber's offices, cheap restaurants, in whose windows one saw piles of unopened oysters weighted down by cubes of ice, and china pigs, and cows knee-deep in layers of white beans. At one end of the street, McTeague could see the huge powerhouse of the cable line. Immediately opposite him was a great market, while farther on, over the chimney stacks of the intervening houses, the glass roof of some huge public baths glittered like crystal in the afternoon sun. Underneath him the branch post office was opening its doors, as was its custom between two and three o'clock on Sunday afternoons. An acrid odor of ink rose upward to him. Occasionally a cable car passed, trundling heavily, with a strident whirring of jostled glass windows. On weekdays the street was very lively. It woke to its work about seven o'clock, at the time when the newsboys made their appearance together with the day laborers. The laborers went trudging past in a straggling file, Plumber's apprentices, their pockets stuffed with sections of lead pipe, tweezers, and pliers. Carpenters, carrying nothing but their little pasteboard lunch baskets painted to imitate leather. Gangs of street workers, their overalls soiled with yellow clay, their picks and long-handled shovels over their shoulders. Plasterers, spotted with lime from head to foot. This little army of workers, tramping steadily in one direction, met and mingled with other toilers of a different description, conductors and swingmen of the cable company going on duty, heavy-eyed night clerks from the drug stores on their way home to sleep, roundsmen returning to the precinct police station to make their night report, and Chinese market gardeners teetering past under their heavy baskets. The cable cars began to fill up. All along the street could be seen the shopkeepers taking down their shutters. Between seven and eight the street breakfasted, now and then, a waiter from one of the cheap restaurants crossed from one sidewalk to the other, balancing on one palm a tray covered with a napkin. Everywhere was the smell of coffee and of frying steaks. A little later, following in the path of the day laborers, came the clerks and shop girls, dressed with a certain cheap smartness, always in a hurry, glancing apprehensively at the powerhouse clock. Their employers followed an hour or so later. On the cable cars, for the most part, whiskered gentlemen with huge stomachs, reading the morning papers with great gravity, bank cashiers and insurance clerks with flowers in their buttonholes. At the same time, the school children invaded the street, filling the air with a clamor of shrill voices, stopping at the stationer's shops, or idling a moment in the doorways of the candy stores. For over half an hour they held possession of the sidewalks, then suddenly disappeared, leaving behind one or two stragglers who hurried along with great strides of their little thin legs, very anxious and preoccupied. Toward eleven o'clock, the ladies from the Great Avenue, a block above Polk Street, made their appearance, promenading the sidewalks leisurely, deliberately. They were at their morning's marketing. They were handsome women, beautifully dressed. They knew by name their butchers and grocers and vegetable men. From his window, McTeague saw them in front of the stalls, gloved and veiled and daintily shod, the subservient provision men at their elbows, scribbling hastily in the order books. They all seemed to know one another these grand ladies from the fashionable avenue. Meetings took place here and there. A conversation was begun. Others arrived. Groups were formed. Little impromptu receptions were held before the chopping blocks of butcher's stalls or on the sidewalk, around boxes of berries and fruit. From noon to evening, the population of the street was of a mixed character. The street was busiest at that time. A vast and prolonged murmur arose. The mingled shuffling of feet, the rattle of wheels, the heavy trundling of cable cars. At four o'clock the school children once more swarmed the sidewalks, again disappearing with surprising suddenness. At six the great homeward march commenced. The cars were crowded, the laborers thronged the sidewalks, the newsboys chanted the evening papers. Then all at once the street fell quiet. Hardly a soul was in sight. The sidewalks were deserted. It was supper hour. Evening began, and one by one a multitude of lights, from the demoniac glare of the druggist's windows, to the dazzling blue whiteness of the electric globes, grew thick from street corner to street corner. Once more the street was crowded. Now there was no thought but for amusement. The cable cars were loaded with theater-goers, men in high hats and young girls in furred opera cloaks. 
On the sidewalks were groups and couples, the plumber's apprentices, the girls of the ribbon counters, the little families that lived on the second stories over their shops, the dressmakers, the small doctors, the harness makers. All the various inhabitants of the street were abroad, strolling idly from shop window to shop window, taking the air after the day's work. Groups of girls collected on the corners, talking and laughing very loud, making remarks upon the young men that passed them. The tamale men appeared. A band of salvationists began to sing before a saloon. Then, little by little, Polk Street dropped back to solitude. Eleven o'clock struck from the powerhouse clock. Lights were extinguished. At one o'clock the cable stopped, leaving an abrupt silence in the air. All at once it seemed very still. The ugly noises were the occasional footfalls of a policeman and the persistent calling of ducks and geese in the closed market. The street was asleep. Day after day, McTeague saw the same panorama unroll itself. The bay window of his dental parlors was for him a point of vantage from which he watched the world go past. On Sundays, however, all was changed. As he stood in the bay window, after finishing his beer, wiping his lips, and looking out into the street, McTeague was conscious of the difference. Nearly all the stores were closed. No wagons passed. A few people hurried up and down the sidewalks, dressed in cheap Sunday finery. A cable car went by. On the outside seats were a party of returning picnickers, the mother, the father, a young man, and a young girl, and three children. The two older people held empty lunch baskets in their laps, while the bands of the children's hats were stuck full of oak leaves. The girl carried a huge bunch of wilting poppies and wildflowers. As the car approached McTeague's window, the young man got up and swung himself off the platform, waving goodbye to the party. Suddenly, McTeague recognized him. There's Marcus Schuller he muttered behind his mustache. Marcus Schuller was the dentist's one intimate friend. The acquaintance had begun at the car conductor's coffee joint, where the two occupied the same table and met at every meal. Then they made the discovery that they both lived in the same flat, Marcus occupying a room on the floor above McTeague. On different occasions, McTeague had treated Marcus for an ulcerated tooth and had refused to accept payment. Soon it came to be an understood thing between them. They were pals. McTeague, listening, heard Marcus go upstairs to his room above. In a few minutes, his door opened again. McTeague knew that he had come out into the hall and was leaning over the banisters. "'Oh, Mac!' he called. McTeague came to his door. "'Hello. Is that you, Mark?' "'Sure,' answered Marcus. "'Come on up.' "'You come on down.' "'No, come on up.' "'Oh, you come on down.' "'Oh, you lazy duck,' retorted Marcus, coming down the stairs." "'Been out to the cliff house on a picnic,' he explained as he sat down on the bed lounge, "'with my uncle and his people, the Sipas, you know. "'By damn, it was hot,' he suddenly vociferated. "'Just look at that! Just look at that!' he cried, dragging at his limp collar. "'That's the third one since morning, it is. "'It is for a fact, and you got your stove going.' "'He began to tell about the picnic, talking very loud and fast, "'gesturing furiously, very excited over trivial details.' Marcus could not talk without getting excited. You ought to have seen. You ought to have seen. I tell you, it was out of sight. It was. It was for a fact. Yes, yes, answered McTeague, bewildered, trying to follow. Yes, that's so. In recounting a certain dispute with an awkward bicyclist, in which it appeared he had become involved, Marcus quivered with rage. Say that again, says I to him. Just say that once more, and hear a rolling explosion of oaths. You'll go back to the city in the morgue wagon. Ain't I got a right to cross a street even? I'd like to know, without being run down. What? I say it's outrageous. I'd have knifed him in another minute. It was an outrage. I say it was an outrage. Sure it was, McTeague hastened to reply. Sure, sure. Oh, and we had an accident, shouted the other, suddenly off on another tack. It was awful. Trina was in the swing there. That's my cousin Trina. You know who I mean. And she fell out. By damn. I thought she'd killed herself, struck her face on a rock, and knocked out a front tooth. It's a wonder she didn't kill herself. It is a wonder. It is for a fact. Ain't it now, huh? Ain't it? You ought to have seen. McTeague had a vague idea that Marcus Scholler was stuck on his cousin Trina. They kept company a good deal. Marcus took dinner with the Sipas every Saturday evening at their home at B Street Station, across the bay, and Sunday afternoons he and the family usually made little excursions into the suburbs. McTeague began to wonder dimly how it was that on this occasion Marcus had not gone home with his cousin. As sometimes happens, 
Marcus furnished the explanation upon the instant. I promised a duck up here on the avenue I'd call for his dog at four this afternoon. Marcus was old Grannis's assistant in a little dog hospital that the latter had opened in a sort of alley just off Polk Street. Some four blocks above, old Grannis lived in one of the back rooms of McTeague's flat. He was an Englishman and an expert dog surgeon, but Marcus Schuller was a bungler in the profession. His father had been a veterinary surgeon who had kept a livery stable nearby on California Street, and Marcus's knowledge of the diseases of domestic animals had been picked up in a haphazard way, much after the manner of McTeague's education. Somehow he managed to impress old Grannis, a gentle, simple-minded old man, with a sense of his fitness, bewildering him with a torrent of empty phrases that he delivered with fierce gestures and with a manner of the greatest conviction. "'You'd better come along with me, Mac,' observed Marcus. "'We'll get the duck's dog, and then we'll take a little walk, huh? You got nothing to do. Come along.' McTeague went out with him, and the two friends proceeded up to the avenue to the house where the dog was to be found. It was a huge, mansion-like place." set in an enormous garden that occupied a whole third of the block. And while Marcus tramped up the front steps and rang the doorbell boldly to show his independence, McTeague remained below on the sidewalk, gazing stupidly at the curtained windows, the marble steps, and the bronze griffins, troubled and a little confused by all this massive luxury. After they had taken the dog to the hospital and had left him to whimper behind the wire netting, they returned to Polk Street and had a glass of beer in the back room of Joe Frenna's corner grocery. Ever since they had left the huge mansion on the avenue, Marcus had been attacking the capitalists, a class which he pretended to execrate. It was a pose which he often assumed, certain of impressing the dentist. Marcus had picked up a few half-truths of political economy. It was impossible to say where, and as soon as the two had settled themselves to their beer in Frenna's back room, he took up the theme of the labor question. He discussed it at the top of his voice, vociferating, shaking his fists, exciting himself with his own noise. He was continually making use of the stock phrases of the professional politician, phrases he had caught at some of the ward rallies and ratification meetings. These rolled off his tongue with incredible emphasis, appearing at every turn of his conversation. Outraged constituencies, cause of labor, wage earners, opinions biased by personal interests, eyes blinded by party prejudice. McTeague listened to him, awestruck. There's where the evil lies, Marcus would cry. The masses must learn self-control. It stands to reason. Look at the figures. Look at the figures. Decrease the number of wage earners and you increase wages, don't you? Don't you? Absolutely stupid and understanding never a word, McTeague would answer. Yes, yes, that's it. Self-control. That's the word. It's the capitalists that's ruining the cause of labor, shouted Marcus, banging the table with his fist till the beer glasses danced. White-livered drones, traitors, with their livers white as snow eaten the bread of widows and orphans. That's where the evil lies. Stupefied with his clamor, McTeague answered, wagging his head. Yes, that's it. I think it's their livers. Suddenly, Marcus fell calm again, forgetting his pose all in an instant. Say, Mac, I told my cousin Trina to come round and see you about that tooth of hers. She'll be in tomorrow, I guess. End of chapter one. Now, the most notable thing about this well, the, the, his prose is just so sharp, but the dialogue, he's not trying to make these people seem more articulate or expressive. And, I mean, the protagonist of this story is kind of stupid, but that's part of the story, and he wasn't afraid, and he had his six songs that he can play, his mournful airs on his concertina, and he sips a little beer at night and sits and plays those six songs. And it makes him feel good. And the little backstory about when he was a car boy at the mines. This is just... I like the storytelling a lot in Frank Nora's writing. And this is Frank Nora. Frank Norris. Can you imagine? We're getting a great... Well, I don't know. They used to teach... Frank Norris in school books. He was The Octopus, which is a book about the trusts and the railroad and how it crushed the farmers. He was a, a crusading kind of a writer. And McTeague is just, if you get a chance to at least see Eric von Stroheim's Greed, which will only take a, well, it's a silent movie 
So for a lot of people anymore, silent movies are a tough watch. But I think it's even free on archive.org, and there's probably a free version also on YouTube. So check that out. I think you're going to like that, if you like this excerpt, that is. And what I was talking about earlier, let's just jump right to that and listen to one of Shamble Constant's tapestries, because Shamble's, he, it's sort of doing what I'm doing here, taking found stuff, although it's much more random and found. And, well, let's hear what it's like, because uh, Shambles is in the groove again. ABC is number one in daytime. There are lots of good reasons why. Spinning the webs of daytime drama are General Hospital. One life to live. And all my children. Our very special and popular afternoon play break is back. And so is the Brady Bunch. ABC's afternoons are filled with winning moments, just like these. Password. Go team. Yes! You won the game! Let's make a deal. You have won the game! Split second. The new $10,000 pyramid. Yes! The newlywed game. The doctor give him anything for his urban? He gave me something. Gave and there are the poignant moments of the girl in my life. You'll find the best part of your day is with ABC. What you see on ABC Saturday mornings, you'll be talking about all weekend. You'll be talking about Hong Kong Fui, a canine crusader who changes from janitor to crime fighter at the close of a drawer. About the new adventures of Gilligan and his shipwrecked friends. About Devlin, three kids out on their own together as a motorcycle stunt team. About Korg, 70,000 BC, a family struggling to survive in prehistoric times. And these are the days about a turn of the century family in rural America. Five bright new shows, part of Fun Shine Saturday each week. Also this season, 14 after-school specials, continuing in the tradition of the Emmy-winning Rookie of the Year. And there's plenty of special early evening entertainment for the whole family to enjoy together, including a special showing of David Hartman's Birth and Babies. ABC programs for children. We take our kids seriously. This is The Hook Show for December 19th, 2005. The Hook Show. The Hook Show. Arg. I'm a pirate. Yarg. Hookshow.blogspot.com. Welcome, guys. This is Digital Dan. And I don't really have anything digital for you today. But I do have some holiday oriented for you. I thought this would be nice during the holiday season. So enjoy our condo Christmas carols that we had on Friday, December 16th. It's kind of long, I tried to cut it down as much as possible, but to not have copyright infringements, I cut down the song so you don't exactly uh, hear the whole bit. Enjoy this because Rose, who put this on for our condos, was really generous to put this on. Uh, it was actually kind of an interesting thing because the way that they had to run it was it couldn't be by the uh, condo association itself because if the condo was to actually put it on, then you would actually have discrimination or bias against a specific religion. Whereas if somebody put it on, whereas Rose put it on, if anybody had anything against what was being said at the carols, then it would be against her, it wouldn't be against the actual condo itself. So enjoy this. This is the Christmas carols that we had at our condos on Friday. Enjoy. Anyway, I'm going along. Let's start off. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Need to look a lot like Christmas. Yay! Give yourself a new spring well. Hey, we can have more fun than somebody that wants to stay. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is a good, good thing. Even, even if you don't know how. Good. And 
I know Kathy says she don't know how, but you know something, she's lying. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Yes. I saw that on the news. Absolutely. Now we're going to sing away in the manger. This, this is for the, well, the children. I remember when I was teaching Sunday school, my little children used to do the, do the um, uh, action, actions with this song. Away in the manger, go crib for a bit. And it was kind of cute. Should we sing all the verses or just two? All right, sing all of them. Yes. 
with balls of holly. Forget it. He's making a special dispensation. Yeah, exactly. When I was a kid, I quite a bright star that these three wise, these three uh, kings saw. So let's sing this one. We three kings are worrying about. You want to sing all of us? Hmm? Yeah, much better. When you were a kid, you used to think we three kings are worrying about. So we don't ever stop. It was loaded and it exploded. <laughs> Kathy says she's going to sing a solo after You never sing a solo after that. Oh, yeah. Carrie, do it in a bushel bath. We used to think I was so mad. I just desecrate the words of that song. That's her. This next one is for our is for our condo here, silver bells. We are so We have a lot of beautiful ringing silver bells tonight. Mm-hmm. Oh, I gotta get my paraphernalia here. Yeah. Oh, she's got to oh, she's got to get her bells. <laughs> you want to look here? No. <laughs> it's written in C, huh? <laughs> Thank you. 
thought was so interesting, and I had this, I had, could you hear me now? I, uh, I ran across something that was so interesting when I was reading about Silent Night. It's okay, I'm just going to read it word for word. I could, I could tell it to you, but I'm going to read it word for word because it's so interesting. On the afternoon of Christmas Eve in 1818, in a tiny village, I, 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 Right? Okay. High in Austria, in Austria helps. Joseph Moore, who wrote the song, as a lo local ca Catholic priest, wrote the stanzas for the season. The church pipe organ had broken, so the so the church organist Franz Gruber wrote the simple tune, setting words to to tenor, bass, and two guitars. That night, the song was heard for the first time in 1818. Soon it was heard beyond the town of Orfordorf. It was anonymously, anonymous, without mention of a composer or a poet. In 1850, neither Moore nor Gruber or others in the village knew their song was rapidly becoming the most beloved Christmas music ever written. Nor did the world know of Moore or Gruber. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. That song was written by a Catholic priest in 1818. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting. I just wanted to share that with you. Well, I would have prayed faith for the whole thing, but then you'd all gone home and hear songs, so I thought I'd wait to the end. Look how talented she is. She plays the piano, she plays the accordion, what else? Are you an A flat? He was then convinced. 
the chief was when he said he was going to be one. And it all started on Christmas. We're, we're celebrating that right now. This is the babe. We're celebrating that right now. And those two words came to me so much. And I thought, myth and truth, myth and truth. And that's, that's about what the Christmas season is about. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't enjoy the, the gaiety of the season, because I know I do. I enjoy the things that, that uh, come forth, and I, I, I'm real thankful for them. But I want to thank every one of you for coming. I just, uh, it, it's been so, so much for me to, to have this uh, time, of, time with you and, and to get to know every one of you. And, and uh, so we don't know from one day to the, one year to the next. We didn't know last year at this time that Don was not going to be with us this year. We didn't know that. He, he wasn't good, but he was doing pretty good, you know, and, and he went fast. And um, I know Ruth was saying about someone else that had just passed away here now. And, you know, May. Mm-hmm. May. I, don't, I didn't know her, but we don't know from one year to the next if we're going to be here or not. So don't plan on me putting on this thing next year because I may won't be here. <laughs> okay, let's say, are we... I want to thank you for doing this. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. Very well. Give her a hand. <laughs> and when I, um, my sister Dolores plays too. It isn't that she doesn't play, she plays very well. But um, when we, I decided to have this, I asked her, I said, if, if I had my this Carol thing, I said, would you play for me? She said, oh yeah, I will. So I guess I have a little bit of backup too. I have <laughs> Okay, let's sing. I wish you a merry. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas. So how was that? That was kind of fun, wasn't it? Excuse the baby in the background, that was our baby. Uh, occasionally she kind of speaks up, she's just starting to speak a little bit. But if you have any comments about that, you can contact me at hookshowplusdan at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Bye. that
you're selfish You never seem to listen What I mean is that you're heartless And you've always been forgiven Time and time Time again But now that I've got the chance to admit it I really have to give you your due credit You have this ability to suck all the merit Out of everything I do Juxtaposition is everything, really. And uh, what that Christmas special with the, who is this uh, Mr. Hook or whatever? That was just uh, the Hook Show with Digital Dan. And then he just drops us into some really small town Christmas celebration. And th- his understanding of copyright is kind of funky. I, usually you can get away with that. It's like if you played Andy Williams' recording of something, they'll jump on you. But ASCAP and BMI are rather kind about allowing people to play copyrighted songs. That As long as you do it yourself, or it's people like that recorded like that. But it was like being a fly on the wall to an event that I can't imagine I ever would have had a chance to be at. And yeah, it was kind of long, but that's that night radio thing. And I'm glad it wasn't edited anymore. And then we heard a bunch of Creative Commons songs. And that's another staple of the Overnight Scape Underground at times. People do their home recordings. And, you know, I don't think any of these people are ever going to be famous. It's just, think about it. 
really. How many people record music and have bands and they do something? And yeah, their friends like it and they like it, but we never get to hear it. And we never get to hear what just you know regular people are doing. And that's kind of neat. And a few songs there. And most of the tapestries, some of them can run as long as this program, two, three hours or more. This was a shorter one, just to give you a feel for... Shambles just has this really nice curation of things. It's like audio eavesdropping at times. I don't know exactly. And that TV clip at the beginning, it's just this neat, random feel that I can appreciate deeply. And uh, last time we had some Gene Shepard and Anne, uh, one of our listeners, uh, was kind enough to say, uh, well, on the last show, he talked about uh, scuba diving in the Red Sea back in the 60s uh, before, well, Israel was just a different thing back then. But we have another Gene Shepard program for uh, our ears to share this one is from 1965, April 24th. And it, these shows didn't have real titles, but the people who collected them and post them have come to call this episode Pursuit of Sin. And this one is one of his limelight shows. I don't usually play them, but I think I ought to play them more because it shows him in a different light where he's live in front of an audience. He loved an audience. So what he would do is there was a nightclub in New York City called The Limelight and he would stand there and do a live remote broadcast right from The Limelight onto WOR Radio. He did this uh, through the mid-60s, Saturday nights. And they're really neat. I think you'll enjoy this different, he's uh, the different energy to him, and there's an audience there that he interacts with, so it's not that sterile studio thing. And, well, let's check this out. Oh, come on! Don't you feel just the slightest bit silly? <laughs> oh, boy, you know, we're down here at the limelight where life is lived to the fullest. Where somehow the ketchup is sweeter, the hamburgers are more rubbery, and where the women begin to feel that deep-seated flow of life flowing down deep in your innards and your vitals and the men are nervous it's right here where that tension exists and tonight since it is the beginning of spring and we're all here in the kind of basic spring training we're all preparing for the new season out there in the darkness way out there in Indiana over there in Jersey, outside of Trenton. You see that big, vast country out there? Isn't it scary? Do you realize we're right on the edge of it here, friends? We're right on the edge of the carpet. If you can imagine America as a great big chunk of corrugated steel, just a big thing there, you know, great big pie plate. We're hanging on the very edge of it, looking out to sea. We are on the island of Manhattan. Yes. And all the rest of the country is clinging to it. For dear life. <laughs> Just hang it on, you know. Here we are. We're the big one. This is New York. Standing tall. Striding like some big mindless fathead. With its world's fair. <laughs> oh, boy. Only New York could produce a World's Fair like we just had. <laughs> Talking about mindless fatheads. You ever been out there? <laughs> you 
You ever get the sense when you walk over that bridge, it's, there's a little buzzing starts in your ears, and that Muzak plays 5 dBs above ground swell, and you hear it. You know, somehow you're in this gigantic, vast atom bomb of total mediocrity. <laughs> A kind of dynamic, friendly mediocrity. Already people are getting their legs in shape for standing in line in front of the Ford Pavilion. <laughs> Can you imagine standing two hours in line to look at the back end of a Ford? The same Ford whose back end you smashed in yesterday in the parking lot, you know. But this is New York, I'll tell you, and it's a yard square. The New York Times stands there looks out over the whole world and it says all the news that's fit to print how's that for a dynamic how's that for a, a, a fantastically arrogant a, a magnificent slogan and it could only come out of New York poor little Chicago it's got a newspaper that gets mad about this you know that, that out there in... in it, oh, I wonder whether or not New Yorkers know they're in a fight continually. That all over this country out there, there are little towns and big towns, little cities and big cities, all of whom feel they're competing with New York. And New York doesn't even know there's a fight going on. <laughs> it just stands there and looks out to sea and scratches, <laughs> spits... <laughs> And merely says, New York, the Empire State. Do you realize, can you imagine if Indiana called itself the Empire State? <laughs> what a joke that'd be. We'd laugh at it, the Empire. Only New York could say, poor little Jersey tries to make a, make a little comeback. It says, we're the Garden State. <laughs> we got gardens over here. New York's got an empire. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, you know, I, I'd love to see... Wouldn't you love to see truthful slogans on license plates? <laughs> the junkyard state! <laughs> <You know? laughs> I know which state would have that one, don't you, friends? Or, or, or the smelly state. Well, now, now I, I'll tell you... The reason I brought that up is because I grew up in a smelly state. No, seriously. Uh, those of you who live in the East don't recognize that some people live out their entire lives in the middle of a kind of moiling fruitcake of decadence, smell, and noise. Just a gigantic cacophony of 20th century life. In fact, I can remember in my home... Back, back in Indiana, I lived in the industrial part of Indiana, by the way, where you'd open the front door and you would hear the fresh air falling in. <laughs> Made a kind of clumping sound. <laughs> <laughs> My mother used to freeze it. <laughs> We'd keep it for the winter, you know. <laughs> make popsicles out of it things like that. <laughs> but you know tonight since since it is since it is spring and we are very fortunate to be here in New York City all the way out there in the darkness in that great vast inverted bowl of of America there are countless people who are pacing like tigers oh yeah they stand in front of their TV set. They walk back and forth. Where do all the TV shows come from? New York. Johnny Carson, all these guys are in New York. Maybe once in a while one comes out of California. Can you imagine the Tonight Show coming every night from Zanesville, Ohio? <laughs> oh, no. No, no. And neither can they imagine. And every night they walk back and forth in front of that set. There's New York. Ooh. And then that show goes off. California. And all he can do is look up at the skies of Iowa. They live in the land that does not exist. They just don't exist. The turnpikes go over them. 
the 707 jets go over them. And all the while, they have a vague suspicion that they're living in America. But they're not sure of it. No, they're not. That's why those people are very insecure out there. And they plan, they plot, they, they work with their lives like, like putty, trying to figure out some way to go to one or the other coast. Why do you think everybody in Iowa, when he retires, goes to California? And everybody in Indiana, when the two weeks come up, they stand in front of Rockefeller Center. <laughs> they want to see the real thing. They want to see life, you know. And here we are, friends. We're here at the summit, the pinnacle. There is nothing else. Isn't that scary? Isn't that a scary thought? That there's no place to go from this, from this point right here. Well, of course, spring gives us the illusion that it's going to work out. That by August, you're going to be skinny. You're going to be brown. Your eyes are going to be glistening. Your stomach is going to be like a washboard. And the chicks are going to be clinging on both arms. This is by August, you figure. Well, by August, you will begin already to plot for the next year. <laughs> And so it is with life eternally. And I think this is because when we were kids, and by the way, I think since uh, this is a springtime show, we might as well deal with a very touchy subject that's hardly ever discussed. And that subject is the eternal subject of capital punishment in private lives. You're aware, of course, that capital punishment is a big, big discussion today. It's all over the world they're talking about it. But each one of us has known a kind of capital punishment. Do you remember when you were a kid? You know, it's very hard to actually remember when you really were a kid. Because we're so much a creature of myth. You know, we create all this jazz about how great it was and how we played mumbly peg. And by the, oh, it's all yard wide. It's, you know what it is, you know. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could use some of the great phrases. If we weren't on the radio, I could tell you what it is. You know, We begin to create this myth about childhood, but we don't remember how it really was. And each one of us, since we come out of American homes, had a kind of capital punishment, a symbolic, great, avenging strap. Do you remember the strap? What was the thing that your parent, your mother, or your father threatened you with? Which, what was it? Some people had a strap. We did not have a strap at home. The, the atom bomb in my house was my father. <laughs> that whenever I was pushed to the extremity, you know, I was backed up like this, my mother would say, All right, one more, one more yell out of you like that, and I'm going to tell your father. <laughs> He didn't care, you know. My father was totally uninvolved. Just like atom bombs. They got no conscience, you know. They're totally uninvolved. And I, I remember on those terrible days, you know, when I had, whatever it was I had done, like, like, uh, like the time my mother found all those dirty books in the icebox in the basement. Oh, I shouldn't have brought that up. It's spring. <laughs> you know, that's, that's something that I've often wondered about in connection with women. Because, you know, men, one of the things that men do when they write, you know, they do a lot of writing. Men write most of the novels and all that, and they're always romanticizing women. They always like to think that women somehow are, well, they're like men, and yet on the other hand, they can't accept that. Did women, and men, I'm asking you a question. If you remember when you were 10 years old, do you remember those rotten, crummy thoughts you'd get? <laughs> that you didn't quite understand? Because you didn't know anything about anything, biology or zoology or even birds and bees. You, know? you just knew there was something growing inside you. And you'd hear a little bubbling once in a while. You're like some rotten swamp. <laughs> you'd hear boom. And this terrible poisonous gas would come out of your ears. You know. 
And you're a little kid, you know, you're walking around. <laughs> Once in a while, something would pop out on your skin. You hold on to it, you know. And then boys almost invariably begin to look for things in books. Now, there's various times. I remember sitting back there and, and in, in class one day, and somebody nudges me. <laughs> he nudges me, and he hands me a book. It was a history book. And in the history book, they had underlined something in red. One of the, one of the real rotten kids behind. Under, with little exclamation points. Oh, boy, you know. <laughs> Hands it to me. I read it. I didn't get it. I didn't know what was rotten about it. I said, gee whiz, that's rotten. <laughs> I pass it on. <laughs> it was something about Elizabeth I. And ever since that time, whenever they talk about Queen Bass or Elizabeth, I, get, I feel funny. You know? <laughs> there was something about her I didn't understand. Well, uh, do women have this? Do girls hide down in the coal bin? Do girls hide down in the basement under the stairs with crummy little books that they hand to each other out on the, out on the, out on the playground, do they? Look at, look at that funny... <laughs> well, it's spring, you see, and right now it's happening all over. And I remember one of the... Oh, the terrible experience that happened in springtime. I'm about... Oh, about 14. I'm big for my age. I'm with Flick. Flick is six feet two at the age of 14. Schwartz is five feet wide at the age of 14. <laughs> You know, and we had lived next to the blast furnace long enough that there was a sort of a gray pallor over us. And we could pass for any age. You know, kids at a certain point can get by with almost anything. They can say they're 20 or they can say they're 3. It doesn't make any difference. And we, we decided one night, and this is the, I, I, I suppose, the beginning of sin, you might call it, because we all had to start our career in sin. Each last one of us, there had to be that first instant when we stepped into that fantastic void. You ever have that feeling that there is, there is two sides to life? Over here is that great sea of depravity, you know? And over here is that beautiful beach, that, that, that Jones Beach of goodness, you know, you're standing there. <laughs> You know, you walk, oh, look at that guy, he can't even look, he's got his face covered. You walk around on the beach and the sun is shining down on you, you know, you're only about five or six, and you hear the lapping of the waves. And at first, you have been warned that the water is deep, and that there are sharks. Be careful. But you can't stay away. You walk over, and there has to be that instant but the toe goes in. <laughs> and you find you like it. You go back again. <laughs> and you stand around and pretend like your feet are dry. Well, lo these many eons ago, the four of us, me, Schwartz, Flick, and Bruner, are down in Bruner's basement. <laughs> And we're sitting around, you know, you know how kids are, we're playing pinochle. Fourteen years old. You know? <laughs> and it is, a, it is a Saturday, you see. A long Saturday. It's spring. We've been playing ball in the morning. And you know, the whole thing, the cake of yeast that is a kid is beginning to sprout and send out little twigs and stuff. So we're sitting here playing. When all of a sudden, Flick. I remember it was Flick because of later and subsequent events. Flick said, what should we do tonight? <laughs> well, usually it was like, let's go out and play red light or kick the can, you know. Let's go out and yell. Or let's go out and, you know, push girls or holler or do something. See? And Flick says, what should we do tonight? And somehow we knew that what we were going to do that night, we were really going to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and Bruner says, well, I don't know. And Schwartz sitting there, sneaky little Schwartz, comes up with it. 
He says, hey. And we all four get together because right upstairs is Mrs. Bruner, a true story reader, by the way, <laughs> sitting up there next to her icebox waiting for old Mr. Bruner to come home. He'd been drunk for seven months now. <laughs> they knew he'd come home, though, eventually. We all gathered together, and, and Schwartz says, let's go to the Star and Garter. Do you know what the Star and Garter is? The Star and Garter was the raunchiest, crummiest, hairiest, smelliest burlesque house in all of the Midwest. It's what they called a stand-up burlesque house. They didn't have seats. They couldn't trust the people to sit there or anything. It was, oh, it was open. It was like a bullpen, see? And we had been hearing for years about this. Now, remember that this was a mythical place. It was a place that once in a while we'd drive past in the car, and my father would look out and just look. <laughs> And they had these big cutouts in front, you know, gigantic cutouts of women. Fantastic women with feathers all over their heads, you know. And above it, it would say, candy bar. In person. That kind of thing. Flame guts here tonight. <laughs> oh, boy, you know, these big women. And they were 18 stories high. And the old man would just drive past. <laughs> and it was rumored that on certain decadent... New Year's, my father and Uncle Fred and Uncle Carl would go down and take in what is euphemistically known as the Midnight Show. It was, it was kind of the epitome of, of decadence and, and, and terrible sin. And so Flick and Bruner and Schwartz and myself are sitting. This is a fantastic idea. Do you realize how difficult it is to make a decision like that? I mean, it's like four statesmen sitting there and then somebody says, what do you say we have war? <laughs> Out of war, fellas. <laughs> That'll cause a little excitement. Well, of course, at first, there was a little doubt. Like Flick says, how much is it? <laughs> Schwartz says, oh, I don't know. We ought to go down and see. We all had a paper route. You know, we had a couple of dollars in our life savings. <laughs> Bruner says, well, I... I think we ought to go. Let's go look in front anyway. And a half an hour later, by, by the way, my mother still doesn't know about this. <laughs> you know, it's terrible how, how your mother, no matter how old you get, your mother still thinks you're really a kid. And she doesn't know, well, she does really know you know about these things, but she doesn't want to admit it. Oh, yeah, I've known guys with nine kids. <laughs> who their mother still thinks he's dating her, you know? <laughs> you don't say anything about this, right? It's all done by osmosis or something, you know? <laughs> Some sort of isometric exercise or something, you know? <laughs> and, and, and you know, so here we are, you know, we're all sitting there, gee, you know, this fantastic moment of terrible guilt. We are feeling guilty even before we do it. You know, it's really feeling rotten. And 20 minutes later, we are in front of the Star and Garter. Isn't that a great name for us for a show? The Star and Garter. Have big, big electric lights all over the front of it. And it's in one of the raunchiest sections of the loop. Star and Garter. And there's bums in all the doorways, you know, and it's got the big cutouts. And you can hear the music inside. You know that kind of music they play? It's like, wah, 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 wah. And then you can hear, boom, ba da boom, ba da boom, ba da boom. There's something about a tom tom being beaten <laughs> in the middle distance, I'll tell you. you -dum -da -ba -dum. And then you hear the sound floating out over State Street of a tenor. So they always had a tenor. And the tenor was singing, A pretty girl is like a melody. Somehow it made it genteel. <laughs> you know? And all the while, while he's singing, this chick is tearing his stuff off, you know. 
<laughs> and he's standing over there saying, Hey, pretty girl. <laughs> well, here we are. We're out in front and we're walking back and forth. And finally, after 15 minutes of walking, by the way, they had a continuous show. Didn't make any difference. What time you came in, the same scene was up there on the stage. Went all on and on and on. And so finally Schwartz says, Flick, you're the biggest. Go on over and get four tickets. <laughs> Flick walks over. Flick's back. It was one dollar and ten cents each, which was the biggest investment in sin. <laughs> I mean, financially wise, that any of us had ever made up to that point. Oh, a few of us had bought a book here and there for a nickel or a dime. I remember Winnie the Winkle. Winnie Winkle had a little thing going there. Tilly the Toiler had a thing. And... But that was another scene, you know. That wasn't live. You know, that was playground stuff. But this was a buck ten. You realize in the Depression, a buck ten, what that is? I made 73 cents a month from my paper route. I'm shooting the whole summer here, you know. And it better go, man. I mean, this is a big scene, so, so Flick comes back, and he's got the tickets. They're just little orange tickets, you know, the kind that you get that just say, tear off half, the kind that says, free stub, and all, a little ticket. It's interesting how innocent sin looks. It often looks, you know, like a bingo game. Little things like that, see, and I got the ticket, Schwartz has got his ticket. We're all trying to walk like men, you know, bums. Walk. <laughs> Sorry, you know that cool walk in there. And I don't know whether you've ever seen the lobby of a genuine Burley house. It's a very peculiar thing. It is not like Rockefeller Center or Radio City. There's a strange atmosphere. There's little guys lurking with dark coats. They watch. They're standing by hallways and selling things out of the corner. We walk through, and all the while in the background you could hear... Doom, da, da, doom, da, da, doom, da, da, doom, da. Like a magnet, it's pulling us in. Ooh, it's pulling us in. You just can't help it, and the blood is flowing, and you can just feel it pounding, and your your brains and your guts are moiling. Doom, da, da, doom, da, da, doom. And we are now in the auditorium. It was like no show I have ever seen. You could just see a dark mass of men standing, all standing. The floor is tilted. And it goes down on a sharp angle, and up there in front, in this, this purple and green light, is a girl with gold hair, with sequins in it. A girl. This was like looking at the Taj Mahal, a girl. I mean, all of a sudden, I recognized what they were talking about. Up to this point, you know, it had been Esther Jane Alberry. And Helen Weathers, here is this thing up there with the tassels. Doom, da, da, doom, da. <laughs> and it's all going, you know. And down in the pit, this guy's got the tom-toms going. And this purple light, and this green light, and this yellow light. And the guy is standing over here singing, A pretty girl is like a... Oh, yes, it was a Nelson Eddy of South State Street. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Flick and Schwartz, but we all get in the back there. We're standing like this, watching this thing watching it go on and I can't I can't even go into to describe the details of what happened except that I can say that as it went on I began to feel more and more and more like a little kid more and more I'm getting littler back there you know and these people keep coming out boom, da, da, boom, and all of a sudden the lights went on absolutely the lights went on and here is this entire room filled with guys wearing fedora hats they don't even take their coats off when they go in there. You know, they all stand like them with the fedora hats like that. Cigars sticking out of their mouth. And me and Flick and Schwartz and Bruno. <laughs> the four of us. And down the center aisle comes this guy. Immediately he comes out and he says, All right, before the next show begins, we have genuine Mexican hand tool wallets here. Genuine Mexican hand tool leather wallets and each one contains a beautiful picture imported from Paris, men. Do not tell anyone where you got these pictures, men. You understand, of course, what I'm talking about. We also have here a genuine box of saltwater taffy imported all the way from Atlantic City, New Jersey. 
containing a wonderful souvenir of your visit here, if you know what I mean, man. We're standing back there. And Schwartz said, gee, I'd like some saltwater taffy. <laughs> and I suddenly realized my wallet was worn. And these guys come wandering back and they're selling this stuff. The show will not go on until we get rid of the last box of saltwater taffy. Saltwater taffy here. The show is ready to go. In one minute, we've got to get rid of this last box. And Schwartz popped. He gets this box. It cost him one buck. Schwartz was wiped out for the whole evening. <laughs> he was dead. This was Schwartz. His whole life is down the drain now, after all. I mean, when you're going to sing, you might as well go to hell all the way. <laughs> Staggering around with saltwater taffy, you know. <laughs> he got the saltwater taffy, and, 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 the, and the four of us stood back there, and the show began again. And on came the girl with the fantastic gold hair. And Flick says, this is where we came in. <laughs> he said, we came in at this point. You know, there was no plot. <laughs> Somehow we figured somebody would come in on a horse and there'd be shooting or something. And we were used to different kinds of shows. Not dramas going. We stand there and watch. Through the entire scene again, all the way, the girl with the purple hair, the one that played the violin, there was one that had Indian clubs, and she did stuff with the Indian, oh, I can't tell you about that one. And we're watching this, it was a fantastic thing, Schwartz was thinking of trying it in the gym class the week after. And we're watching this, and after, after that, the next show, out came the guy again with the wallets, and Flick, and Schwartz, and Bruner, myself silently with the other sinners walked out into the springtime of State Street. Do you know, you know that feeling that all of you have when you leave a movie? That, that feeling of going back into reality? That strange feeling of coming out of, you're, you're, you're in a fantastic movie that's color and it's 18 feet wide and 40 feet high and all that, and suddenly you're out in Times Square. You know, you're walking off. You don't know whether you want to go back in or whether you're glad you're out. Which is it? Well, Schwartz and Flick and Bruno and myself are suddenly back out in the real world, and we are feeling as depraved, as rotten, as debauched, and not only that, we're scared out of our skull. <laughs> that the word is going to get back that this Saturday night we spent it eating saltwater taffy and buying Mexican wallets. And we walked down State Street to get back to the Model A, the car we had, and none of us said anything. That's the way sin affects you, you know. Nobody said a word. Just, it's getting cold. Boy, you got the keys, Flick. We get back in the car. The Model A starts, and we start heading back to Indiana. Flick is driving. And all of a sudden, Flick said, Gee, that was great. <laughs> Schwartz says, no, I don't know. He came from a very religious family. No, I don't know. And I just said, well, <laughs> he, <laughs> why? <laughs> and Bruner said nothing. And we rode and rode and rode and rode. And suddenly Schwartz said, let's open the taffy. <laughs> we hadn't even opened the taffy yet. She opens the taffy. He dumps it out. There's a couple of little pieces of old petrified taffy. And he throws it out. And in the box of taffy was a postcard, a souvenir of Paris. Well, it was not exactly a picture of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> but it wasn't exactly what it was sold to be either. It was just a very large lady standing next to a maroon drape. And she was wearing a yellow bathing suit. Schwartz had this. I had my wallet, 
My wallet had a picture of Theda Berra or something in it. It was saved from the Boer War. And we got home about 12.30, quarter to one, and went down in Bruner's basement and started to play Pinochle. Four of us. Like this. But I want to tell you this. From that minute on, the Pinochle game had a completely different complexion. Each one of us had seen that kind of underbelly of sin and existence. That bottom thing. That thing that just lays out there and that works its way through your system like some kind of crawling, crawling thing. Is it evil or is it good? Speaking of the evil and the good, what station is this, friends? Are they evil or good? Evil! And where are we? New York! Is it evil or good? He's from Ohio. <laughs> you know, you know, I'll tell you. <laughs> you know, when, when, when you come into springtime, it's, it's, it's a very nervous time. And I, I, never, I never could understand just how women reacted to it, as opposed to how men do. I'll tell you one thing we had in our school in spring. I don't know whether you ever had this. Did you ever have a lice inspection? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. A few of you remember. Well, maybe here in the city they just ignore them. <laughs> but I remember, I remember Miss Shields every two weeks taking us down to the nurse's office. And we're all standing in line, you know, like this. And the nurse and the doctor are going through our hair with a comb. They're looking at. <laughs> You know, you know, you, you never expect to have anything happen, but I'll never forget sitting behind this girl named Smithers, Arlita Smithers, and her hair moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I used to sit back there and watch him. You know, this little, there was this little caravan that would go over the top. Oh yeah, they were carrying little signs and things. You know. <laughs> She had a whole she had a whole life going on there, <laughs> and then there was there was I, I know I shouldn't bring these things up at the limelight where you all sitting out there with hamburgers and stuff, <laughs> but I mean this is all part of springtime. See, they didn't do it in the winter because we grew our crop in the spring. That was when everything everything blossomed, and and about this time of the year, the doctor, our school doctor, who must have seen hell boy the way it really was. The school doctor would ask you questions that had to do with the lice. And then he would ask you about something called worms. <laughs> Did you ever hear of kids getting worms? Well, let me tell you one time, I, I, I had this awful feeling. I'm going to just tell you, I'm, I'm going to confess something here. Have you ever had the feeling secretly at any time in your life that you were the victim of some terrible and loathsome disease that you didn't want to say to anybody. Some awful disease, like something you've seen on a poster, you know, be careful of. <laughs> you walk down the street. <laughs> it says, this means you. It's not me, no. And then you can say, yeah, yeah, I got it. It's awful, yeah. My life is ruined, oh. <laughs> well, there was a thing, there were certain things in our, there were certain things in our neighborhood that were considered t loathsome for kids to get. And if kids got them, they were debauched. If you turned up with a little family of lice behind your right ear, forget it. It just shows what a rotten, crummy home you came from. And that was the first thing that my mother used to say, do you want them to think? What kind of a house do you think? She used to say, look, change your underwear before you go to school. If you get hit by a car, what are they going to think? <laughs> you know, some of my mothers think of it, they bang, you're hit by a car. You know, and they can see you down at Bellevue, and they got this broken little body, you know, and they're taking it, and they say, look at the family he comes, look at that underwear. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
My mother also had a thing about socks in the same department. I had to change my socks twice a month because of that. <laughs> well, we, we also had a thing. See, there was another thing that it was reputedly, it was kind of the ultimate in rottenness if you got it. They were, they were, they were kind of mythical. It's like, it's like some kind of mythical oriental disease that you hear all of your life about, like elephantiasis. You heard of it, you know, none of you ever get it. You don't come down with a case of elephantiasis. I'm staying home from work today, boss. Elephantiasis. <laughs> My foot's 40 feet high, boss. You, know? <laughs> you, know? you never think in terms of this kind of stuff. Well, there was a disease <laughs> that hit kids called worms. And, and, and there were all kinds of myths about it, rumors about it, all kinds of, uh, not, not really rumors, bits of misinformation, but my mother used to say one thing. I'd eat, I, whenever you'd eat candy, like if they had a box of fudge, she'd say, now look, don't eat too much fudge, you'll get worms. Well, I was a secret candy stealer. I used to go down to George's, George's news shop where they sold candy and newspapers. They sold spicy Western and spicy detective where all that little gemutlik life went on, the kids, you know, you'd, you'd buy the penny candy and all that stuff. And I used to steal Baby Ruth candy bars. I was also very big on a thing called Butterfingers. <laughs> and they weighed, they weighed at least a quarter of a pound. They came in a shoulder holster, big, fat candy bars, and something called Powerhouse. Do you remember that candy bar? Totally indigestible. <laughs> was made out of some kind of plastic material all pushed together, you see. And I used, to, I, used to, I used to be a paper kid, see, and I'd go down there, and George was the guy that had the paper rod, see. And we would all sit on the floor at George's place and fold our papers, you know, putting them in a bag. You know? And every once in a while, when George wouldn't be looking, you'd go... Into the paper, you know? And, you know, you'd get out with a couple of baby roots and maybe a Butterfinger. And while you're on the route, you know, you're riding the bike and you're stuffing your mouth like that, see? My mother figured that the only candy I got was the candy that she doled out. Well, this continued for about a year. I must have put down 18 million, at least 18 million calories a week in stolen candy. And, of course, all the while, I've got a little sense of guilt, but not really, because candy was fair game, you know? We figured that George was an oppressive employer. And not only that, he was a Greek. You know, and whatever we could get from George was fair game. You know, I start, we'd say, hey, George, you know, George, all right, you kids, get out, go on. That was our relationship with George. And so it produced a fantastic amount of candy eating among all, the whole crowd. And each one of us had this little sense of guilt. And so would come Saturday, and my mother would have her little pinochle crowd would gather, you know, the ladies would sit there, and they'd have bridge mix. And I would sneak into the kitchen, put my hand into the bowl, and get maybe seven or eight pieces of bridge mix. And my mother would say, let's see how many you've got. She'd say, here, give me that big one and this one. You're going to get worms. She did not realize I was filled with candy from here all the way down to the bottom of my feet. I would walk. You could hear cashew nuts clanking. You could hear all kinds of chocolate squishing when I would walk, you know, pimples coming out. My teeth were so soft they swiveled, you know. I got to turn them around, take them out, and put them in again, you know. I was, in, I was a real candy nut. And she kept saying, worms. You're going to get worms. You know, it's just one of those mother things, like you're going to break your glasses or, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. Just a mother thing. And one day, one fantastic day, I am sitting in Miss Robinette's class. It is a hot spring day. We have just had our lice inspection. I have passed with flying colors. I didn't have any hair at all, you know. 
and I'm feeling clean and nice, and I'm sitting there, you know, like kids do, when all of a sudden, I began to feel a suspicious itching. Worms! I've got worms! Well, <laughs> I know it's in bad taste, friends, but life is in bad taste. Let's admit it now, it's life. <laughs> and I scratched. <laughs> and then it went away for a couple of seconds. That's the, tr that's the thing about these evil diseases, you see. They keep coming and going. You know, like on Wednesday, you may have a slight attack of a elephantiasis, and then it goes away. Your foot gets small again. You think you're okay. Well, I sat there for about five minutes saying, oh, well, just my knickers are growing again. <laughs> you know, I had knickers that actually had taken root. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, they had twigs sticking out. <laughs> yeah, a, a boy's, a, 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 boy, a genuine boy's pants are like a compost heap. I have a feeling you could just bury about seven pairs of them out in the backyard and you could grow anything. <laughs> Rich and ripe. I'm sitting there scratching and it goes away. And I felt that fantastic. You know that wonderful relief that all of you felt when you think you've got a deadly disease and it, 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 isn't, not, it isn't true. Ah, oh, it's gone. <laughs> It's not only itching, it's beginning to walk around. <laughs> it's going... I can feel it, you know. And the clouds dragged on and on, and I'm sweating. Oh, sweating. Just absolutely sweating like mad. Oh, but from fear, you know. It's, it's like retribution at last is being visited on me. All those candy bars. The class is over. I go rushing out into the, out into the playground scratching and you know that feeling all of you have had that feeling in health I'm talking about health here of being suddenly separated from the herd you are the unclean one yes and all the rest of them are having fun in the sun carefree they run and they say hey throw in a ball flick let's go and the chicks are walking and there you are full of worms Maggots crawling in you. Little things are eating and yelling and hollering. They're burping. And you can feel them like this, and I'm standing like that. Well, then they go away again. You feel good again. Now I am home. I'm feeling clean for at least an hour. Just one of those momentary things. And I'm home about a half an hour, sitting in the living room. There they go again. And out in the kitchen, I could hear my mother making supper, walking around with the pots and the pans. My mother who had predicted worms. She had predicted it. That's what makes it so, so terrible. The people all of your lives tell you that awful things are going to happen and you never believe them. How many of you actually believe there's a hell? You've been told this all the time now. One poor soul says, me. Well. That depends on who you're married to. <laughs> you know? And, and, and nobody here does, you see. But we've been told all of our lives, in one way or another, haven't we now, that we are going to reap, we are going to reap the crop of our sins. We've been told this. And yet none of us believe it. None of us believe in a hell, in, in essence. Well, how are you going to feel if five minutes after you have departed this mortal coil, suddenly you wake up and you're in a gigantic chute? Whoa! Down and down you go. Boom, you land there. Oh, my God, no. And you see these guys shoveling. I say, hi, Charlie, we knew you'd be along. Let's go. Oh, no. You stagger back. All of my life, I could... What are you going to do, see? Well, it was like all of my life I've been hearing about worms. Now I got them. They're in me. So I sit during supper and I could feel them coming out of my ears. 
and looking around and waving. <laughs> looking around and yelling, and I am in absolute fantastic agony. Oh, boy, you know, this is not a made-up story. This is one of the true hell moments of my kid life because worms in my neighborhood were like the equivalent of the worst kind of social pariah you could be, to have worms. And when you had worms, they dosed you with all kinds of stuff, and they set you in a little special place. They didn't let you eat sandwiches with the rest of the kids, you know, the whole scene. And so here I am. I'm wormy. I am wormy. Me. And Jack Armstrong comes on the radio. Raise the flag for Hudson High, boys, known throughout the land. And up to this point, Jack Armstrong had been one of me, my friend Jack and Billy and Betty and the whole crowd. And suddenly they were part of that wonderful, that wonderful world of the clean people. You can't imagine Jack Armstrong with lice. He doesn't even have hair, you know. He's just there and I'm sitting, oh, sweating through this thing. Now it is supper time. Now supper is over. And the itching continues. It is now 8 o'clock. Time to go to bed is coming up, which is at 9 o'clock. And the itching is getting intolerable. I'm standing in the corner like this. You know. <laughs> My mother keeps saying, what's the matter with you? You know, but How are you going to say, Ma, I've been, I've been stealing candy from George. I got the worms. Do you tell her, or what do you do? How does a kid get rid of worms by himself? I thought, immediately I thought to myself, drink a lot of water to drown them. <laughs> so I'm in there, you know, and I'm slugging down the water. Oh, Ooh, I'm drinking water. They still itch. Apparently, they are aquatic. <laughs> That's all they needed was a little water, you know? <laughs> Oh, gee. it's now about 10 minutes to 9. It's time for bed. And you know how mothers get this kind of, this tender involvement with the kid, time for bed. You know, they come in, they say, now, come on, get undressed, let's go. Come on, Randy, let's go, Jeannie, my kid brother, you know, let's go. Come on now. Now, don't, don't, come on now, don't waste time. you got to get up in the morning. I'm not going to throw with you in the morning. Now, come on, let's go, let's go. Okay, come on now. Brush your teeth now, you know, that my, my, my mother stuff. And I'm in there, oh, itching. <laughs> and I take off my shirt. And then I take off my corduroy knickers. And I had this pair, <laughs> I had this pair of special underwear. Now, you won't believe it or not, but in those days they had underwear that had endorsements. You could buy Mike Krivich underwear. <laughs> yes, you could. These were baseball plays. It was like if you could uh, if you could imagine today buying Mickey Mantle socks. Well, I had a pair of Zeke Benora underwear. <laughs> and, <laughs> These underwear were only two days old. I had gotten them at Sears Roebuck. They had a big white sock sale down there. Well, I took off my underwear, and all of a sudden, I realized why Zeke Panora was such a rotten fielder. <laughs> it was the underwear that was doing it. Somehow, this underwear was the most itchy underwear I ever had. It was itchy underwear. I can't tell you the fantastic feeling of relief that I had. I took them off and I felt, I felt 40 feet high. My kid brother is running around, you know, hitting his head on the radiator and all that stuff. I'm saying, hi, Red, come on over here, let's play, Red. You know, ah, throwing my kid brother up, he looks, what's the matter, is he a nut? What happened to him? Come on, Randy, let's play. Wow, you kick him, you know. Hey, let's go, Randy. Let's play football. You'll be the football. Come on, let's go. Boom. You know. right. My mother comes in and says, what's the matter? I said, nothing. Nothing. And do you know to this day, I have not told my mother why 
my Zeke Benora underwear disappeared. <laughs> and somewhere in some garage in the Middle West, under a five-gallon tin of Sinclair number 30 oil, there is a pair of Zeke Benora underwear. Rolled up because, you see, my mother had given me these underwear as a big special treat. And all I could say later, she said, where's your Zeke Benor underwear? So said, no, I must have lost them. <laughs> Kids are not very good at inventing stuff, you know. <laughs> must have lost them. I swallowed them or something, you know. <laughs> well, that, that, that instant, you know, that moment of, of thinking that I was a social pariah, that I had contacted one of those terrible, unmentionable diseases, taught me something forever and ever. I never forget it. Never. I have remained to this day consistent, and I maintain fidelity to this rule. Be careful of tight underwear. <laughs> Look out for itchy underwear, friends. It's liable to do all kinds of things for you. It can ruin your batting average. <laughs> yes, it can make you sweat. And it can make you nervous. And it can make you feel that somehow, someplace, you have mislaid something. This is WOR Radio, your station for news. Oh, uh, yeah. That just kind of ended because when he was doing the live show, I guess he couldn't look at a clock or didn't. He had a different timing, so often these stories would just end, and whoever was in the main studio, of course the radio station has to hit their times and their places, and they just cut it off, and what you just, this is W-O-R, and that's the end, and of course if you were at the nightclub, he would continue until he realized, you know, some hand signal, but that... Who, number one, I mean, just that last part, have you ever heard a story of somebody having worms, much less an underwear, and how that could somehow become so interesting to listen to? That's that's the magic of Gene Shepard, uh, bringing you into a world, this may have been some minor nothing. It may be something made up out of whole cloth. It's hard to tell. And his biographer seems to have thought that a lot of this was just these tiny things that he would, well, a good storyteller, what do they call it? Gilding the lily. They just make up all these extra details and bring you into their story and the expressions of his voice, this, the, the mastery of Gene Shepard is something to behold. And I have this deep appreciation as, I, I hate to overuse that word, to digress for a second, that, you know, I've named myself that, and I'm trying to be that. And I think it almost goes without saying, and yet I come back and I say it again, as some sort of artifice. And, I mean, Gene Shepard, I'm sure there are people who heard him on the radio innumerable times and had no idea what his name was. He was just that guy on the radio who told stories at night. Um, the identity isn't what's important. It's the content and how it's done. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. And the part at the beginning, the whole, uh, these young men going to a strip club, just that artifice doesn't exist. Does it exist in our society? Is there still that taboo that somebody hasn't seen what a real woman with their clothing off looks like? And I, while I tend to doubt it, I'm sure there are 
people, just maybe not as common, and you would have to go into the big city, to the dirty part of the city, to a place called something like the Star and Garter, and you sort of know your dad went there. That, I mean, talk about nostalgia. For I mean, there were strip clubs when I grew up, and yeah, I went there and with a morbid curiosity to see what went on there, what was exciting about it, and I don't think I ever got particularly ex- I, I was too, like, worried that somebody would catch or see me there. And again, you know, tell your mother or father, because we would sneak into Johnny's, which was on that same strip as the bars my friends and I were able to sneak into when we were way under drinking age. I was 15 years old, and now... The, well, the drinking age was only 18 at the time. Now it's 21, so that was very different. But there were these strip clubs, and it, just seeing and thinking, not understanding what was going on. I mean, I still don't 100% understand the mechanism behind that. I guess just... The excitement of it, there's some sort of thrill there that, yeah, when I, when it was a total mystery, there was something, but it was more of a combination of embarrassment and this very primitive arousal that has nothing to do with like arousal as I see it now as this old guy. It, it, it's very strange. And the way he would tell it, it this, This is gold, and it's a time capsule as well, because I don't think people think this way exactly, and he expresses it in such a way that, well, at least I can identify it. I'm curious to see whether this sort of thing carries with, say, younger people. Now, if they see, if you want to see a naked girl dance, you can get some app and a naked girl will dance on your desktop. And that was in the 90s. That just isn't something, and uh, our entertainment is far more lenient in that direction. I mean, when I was a kid, there was a show called I Dream of Genie, which you may have, and the whole premise is insane. This astronaut goes to the moon. And he finds this bottle and sneaks it home. And inside of this bottle is this beautiful female woman genie who's willing to do anything he says and calls him master. And somehow over what? Eventually marries her. But somewhere, which killed the show and the frisian and everything. And somehow he just never does what you would think somebody, a male, would do with a beautiful genie woman that is, and is actually throwing themselves at him. And he's playing this coy, uh, this strange morality that today is kind of, it just doesn't read. And to, to what the point I was making was, she had this very, well, sort of revealing costume, but they would not let her show her belly button. The, the, she could show her tummy, and of course her bosoms were very covered. There was no sign of any um, anything on the ends of them. But you also couldn't see this woman's belly button. Barbara Eden uh, was her name. Uh, and if you watch you know, Nick at Night and that kind of thing, you're probably familiar. And... Now, I don't think even on the most chaste programming, maybe on religious programming, you're not, the the outlines of things aren't made pretty crystal clear. And if you go a little farther, I mean, uh, on cable TV, which a lot of very young kids are exposed to. And it isn't that you really could... There were playboys and all that, but there was a taboo attached to it, and now it's just kind of there. We we live in a very... And 
this is like a memory thing for me that I've lived through. It's like thinking what my grandparents must have thought over their 90, 80 years of life and how they looked at change and how when I would tell them I saw something or I did something, they would get this look of like questioning whether this was right or wrong. And I don't think you know, this whole morality and taboo in our culture and what is and isn't at any given time is just a matter of the times. Because you look at human history, at least for us, there are very few things that are just absolutely taboo per se. Uh, there have been times where you know, certain native tribes walked around in nothing. The people of uh, certain Pacific islands were very free and easy. Uh, certain tribes, and I'm sure certain of our forebears, if you dig back far enough, there was a much more libertine or open or just that that was the way it was. That there was a time not long ago where whole families would sleep in the same bed and more children would somehow be generated. And, you know, you don't want to speculate too much on that. But it's all very intriguing. And I'm just riffing on Gene Shepard. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Gene Shepard is brain food in a certain way to me. And, of course, as we continue these showcases, uh, I assume that we're going to have more and more Gene Shepard. Moving along, uh, last time we had an episode of one of my favorite kind of spooky, supernatural, uh, it, kind of the pre-Twilight Zone show. It was called Lights Out. And uh, I've dug up another one. This one called Come to the Bank. What's interesting in this is the hysteria that happens with the main character. And, well, let's listen to this together and uh, you can experience it because that's really what I, I guess the crux of what I'm trying to do here is share an experience and maybe we open a dialogue or at least I make some sort of impression and maybe you would go listen to more Lights Out or send me an email and say, I'd like to hear more of those or know more about how the, who made them. And these were written, as I mentioned, by a man named Arch Obler, who in a lot of ways was the Rod Serling of his time. He had a certain social conscience, which Rod Serling had, and definitely a taste for weird stories. And, well, let's listen to Come to the Bank. And uh, this is originally from 1942. This is Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you. These Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. And now, come to the bank. Please, would you come to the bank with me? Please. I... I've asked so many people, but they won't listen to me. You, will you come to the bank with me? No, don't turn your head. Please don't go away. Listen, if I tell you very carefully why I want you to come to the bank with me, you will come, won't you? He's locked up in there. He can't get in the air. Oh, no, don't get excited. I didn't say he was locked up in the vault. All he's got in their vault is money. I don't care about money. All I care about is him. I, I didn't mean to tell you. All right, I did. You've got to come to the bank with me and help me. It's Fred Roth. He's in the bank and he can't get out. 
What are you laughing about? That's not so funny. I tell you, he's in the bank and he can't get out. He's been in there for, I think, it's three weeks. Bless you. Stop laughing. Please listen to me. I'll tell you all about it from the start. I'm a school teacher. At the Maxim High School, I teach physics. It's a rational science. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Mr. Roth teaches in the same school. Psychology. The way of the human mind. But that's not an exact science, is it? The human mind is not exact at all. And that started it. That's what started it. Mr. Roth said to me... Well, speaking quite frankly and candidly, Miss Moss, I don't think very much of your exact sciences. Two and two always add up to four, Mr. Roth. Not where the human mind is concerned. I don't understand. Well... It is my profound conviction that the potentialities of the human mind and body have never been realized by any human creature. But there have been great men. Plato, Lincoln, so many scientists. Yes, but only fractional greatness. Using perhaps one-tenth of the power latent within themselves. It's all a matter of concentration. Thomas Edison used perhaps one iota more concentration than the average man and became one of the great inventors of all times. I tell you, Miss Moss, if men would concentrate their minds to the limit, the universe would be theirs. That's a very innocent thought, isn't it? Just a teacher talking about the human mind. I thought nothing of it. Mr. Roth was such an intense young man. I... I liked his intensity. Just think what could happen if a man could bring his mind to the proper point of concentration. He could move objects with his mind. Yes, why not? Think that a table should move, and it would move. Oh, Mr. Roth. Huh. Think that he wanted to be a certain place, and it would be there. Men conceived this civilization just by a thought, and here it is. All is power of thought over matter. A man thinks a book before the book exists. He thinks a house, and only then the house can be. All is power of mind over matter. I like to watch his eyes while he talked. They were so bright and burning. And his mouth, as he talked, the way it twisted. I couldn't help liking Mr. Roth, could I? We had to dinner together once. Uh, will you have uh, coffee with your dinner or later? No, uh, what did you say? The waiter wanted to know if you wanted coffee with your dinner. Oh, no, no coffee. Oh, we miss you. Very nice of you to have dinner with me, Mr. Roth. Oh, on the contrary, I, I'm grateful to you. You're a, a very good listener. Thank you. I've done a great deal of work in the week since I last talked to you. Have you? Please tell me. Well, it isn't exactly work. It's, it's more of a decision. Yes? Yes, I, I've come to the decision to stop theorizing. Yes, I've decided to put what I believe into practice. I don't know what you mean. No, it's quite simple. The powers of concentration. I've decided to put uh, into practice... Uh, the uh, fruit juice is for the lady? Well, huh? oh, yeah, yes, yeah, for the lady. Uh, uh, concentration, Miss Moss. I've decided to put into practice my theory of concentration. I don't want to anticipate, but I expect wonderful results, Miss Moss. I might even say unbelievable results. Unbelievable results. Oh, must I tell you more? Please, come with me to the bank. All right, all right, I'll tell you the rest. The day after he talked to me in the restaurant, Mr. Roth didn't come to school. I know that because at lunchtime he wasn't in his usual place in the cafeteria. And when I asked, they told me that he suddenly had taken leave of absence and that an extra teacher was taking over his classes. I was very disappointed. A week went by, two weeks. I decided to go see him. I took a few days off from my work. I found out his home number. Friday morning, I bought a new dress. Very becoming one. Then I went to visit Mr. Roth. I was certain he wouldn't be angry with me. It was perfectly proper that I call on him as a friend. Yes, yes, Mr. Roth is at home. There he has for the two back rooms. He has not been out of there for a week. Won't even let me go in to clean up. He go right ahead. Head to the staircase. And to the right. Mr. Roth, are you in there? It's Miss Moss. Could I speak to you for a moment? Standing there knocking, I suddenly realized that the door was ajar. Well, he... But he didn't answer, and yet the landlord had said he was at home. 
I pushed the door open farther and glanced through the opening. <gasps> the Duval! The Duval! Dead! Oh, no, I... No, no, I, I, I'm alive. Oh, I, I thought... Oh, Mr. Roth, your face, the way you look, what... No. Water. Glass. Oh, yes, water. yes, yes. Yes, sir. Well, you, you are sick. I'm not sick. Who was it? Here, here, take it. I'll hold it. Doctor, I'll call a doctor. No, no, wait. But you're ill. Listen to me. Yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sick. Good then what? I told you. But I, I don't know. I, I, I've been sitting here for a week. Sitting for a week? Concentration. Practicing concentration. Concentration. The experiment was, was most successful. Yeah, most successful. I, I've proven that I can do what some of the Orientals profess to do. Slow down through concerted willpower the essential life processes. A week without food and water. Is that not a triumph, Miss Morris? Well, I... I don't know. Mr. Roth, why do you do these things? Uh, I'm trying to explain it to you simply. The human thoughts are like the rays of the sun spreading in all directions. By the use of a lens, the rays of the sun can be focused on one point. And instead of warmth, there, there is a focal point of intense light that can burn its way through all obstacles. And so it is with human thoughts. If, through concentration, a man could focus them on one point, he would be a god among men. I tell you, Miss Morse, that, that I am confident that I, through training, can become that one man in a million. Even, even as muscles can be trained, so I am training my mind. And the day when my training is complete, I will be able to do anything I desire. You hear me? Anything. 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 When he said that, thin and weak and tired as he was, his eyes looked at me. I was afraid. For him. I made up my mind right then. The first thing was to get him out of that room. He ate. Rested. And then went out with me. I don't see why I let you talk me into this, Miss Moss. I have so much work to do. The work will do you good. But where are we going? Well, first I want you to come to the bank with me. Beg your pardon? Well, you see, I, I've been thinking of taking a little vacation, and I need some money. Going to withdraw some. Oh, oh I see. I, I, too, want to get off some place where I can concentrate. Well, yes. Yes, most important. Yes. Uh, have you thought about going out to the country? These buildings, Miss Moss. Look at them. Steel and concrete. So firm and so solid. So enduring. You know something, Miss Moss? What? How fast I... Once upon a time, they were only an idea in man's mind. Perhaps even now they have no solidity, but are, are just ideas hanging in air through which a man with single-mindedness of purpose, could walk as easily as if you were walking through air. Do you understand me, Miss Moss? Well, I, I'm not sure. The country would be a wonderful place to work. Why wouldn't it, Mr. Roth? We went into the bank. He kept talking about the powers of concentration. I hardly listened to him. All I could think about was that somehow I had to get him into a new environment. The foyer of the building where the bank was, we went in. People, elevators. Suddenly, Mr. Roth stopped. He stared at the wall. I said... Mr. Roth! Mr. Roth, what are you looking at? This. This is the time. Time? Time for what? I told you. When my subconscious reached the proper point of incubation, I would know that my powers had reached the point where... I could do anything. Mr. Roth, anything. Let's go. Well, this is the time. Now, 
I must make use of that power now. No, please. What are you going to do? That marble wall. Straight ahead. I say I can walk through it. No, please stop joking. I will. I will. I will walk through. No. Mr. Ross, come back. Don't. Ah! Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. What? The wall. What? Yeah, no! Oh, what? Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross, he walked through the wall. You hear me? He walked through the wall. There's smug and self-certain, don't you? It couldn't have happened. But listen, you pinhead mind, I tell you it did. I saw it with my own eyes. Mr. Roth walked right toward that marble wall and he went into it and then he was gone. You hear me? Gone. But I, I mustn't call you vain and make you angry, must I? Because you must come to the bank with me. Yes, yes, I'll tell you more of just what happened on that day. Oh, I never heard of such a... Now, look, lady, take it easy. Get out of my way. The wall, he walked through that wall. I tell you, I tell you, he walked through that wall. Say, please, He said he did it, he did do it. He walked through that wall. Face with marble. You'd better go home and stop disturbing the beast. Go to the door, lady. So they put me out. I stood in the street. I didn't know what to do. And then I knew. I would wait there until Mr. Roth came back. And he would come back. He'd gone through the wall and he must have come out on the other side. And now he would walk around the building and come back and meet me there. So I waited. Good night, George. See you in the morning. I waited a long time. Are you waiting for something, lady? The bank's closed, you know. I've seen you standing here ever since I got on my feet, so I thought I'd talk to you. A long time. It began to rain. I stood there in the rain. Mr. Roth. And what a terrible thought. What is he? I went to the door of the bank building. It was locked. Let me in. Please, let me in. Listen to me. Just let me in, Mr. Roth. I've got to get to Mr. Roth. Hey, lady, what? what? Don't you know the bank's been closed? I've got to get in. I've got to. I've got to get in. Now, take it easy, you. Hey, aren't you the one that's been standing out hey, here? Let go of me. Mr. Roth is in there. Now, lady. I will get in. Hey, the door. Let go of me. Mr. Roth, I've got to get in. I'll get the door. I will get in. I'll get the door. I will get in. Kicking the door in. Now, you come along with me. Let go of me. Did you get in to see Mr. Roth that night? No. Order in the court. Order in the court. Prisoner will be held for further examination. Next case. I tried to tell them, Mr. Roth, but no one would listen to me. All night. And the next terrible day, no one would listen. Now tell me, do you have dreams, Miss Marsh? Asking me questions over and over. Do you think that people dislike you? Over and over. Have you often seen Mr. Roth or other people disappear? Over and over. When did you first begin to have these uh, hallucinations? But when I tried to tell him about Mr. Roth, he started to say terrible things to me. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Roth has disappeared. It is the opinion of the police that he decamped with this woman's money. Yes, took her money and ran off. Yes, took her money and ran off. I didn't care what they said. I had to get to the bank. You know why? Mr. Roth had started for the wall, and I had seen him go through it, and he hadn't come around to meet me. So there was only one answer. He was still in the wall. And while Mr. Roth was in the wall, they were keeping me in this hospital. I had to get out. How are you resting now, Miss Moss? Miss Moss, where? Window. Nurse, the woman in this room. She's gone. Out of the window. Nurse, nurse, Miss Moss is gone. Got away in the street, still raining. I ran along the dark street until I was at the bank. Closed. There was a dark doorway, another building. I hid in the dark and waited all through the night until morning, until they opened the doors at the bank. I went into the bank. I walked toward the wall. That wall. I wanted to run to it, but I, I walked. 
And I was there. The very wall he'd gone into. Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross. Are you in there? It's, it's Miss Moss. A- Ada Moss. Mr. Ross, please, if you're in there, answer me. They'll see me standing here by the wall talking and they won't let me stand here. Mr. Ross, please, I- I've got my ear close to the wall. If you're in there, answer me. I was right. You did walk into the wall and stay there. Yes, yes, but what are you saying? I, I can't understand you. Please, Mr. Ross, speak so I can understand you. Yes, yes I understand. I will get you out of there. Help! Help! There's a man in the wall. Help me get him out. Mr. Ross, you here? I'll get you help. Hurry, people! Bring us! back in the hospital. They didn't believe me. They didn't help Mr. Ross. I was very sick. I don't know how many days I was in the hospital. Then I was all right. They let me out. And this is your last warning, Miss Moss. You are to stay away from the bank. You are to behave yourself as a good, intelligent citizen you normally are. Your last warning, Miss Moss. And all the time, Mr. Roth was in that war, waiting for me to help him. And there was a little time left. A man such as Mr. Roth, powers of concentration. He could and did perform a miracle, walking through a war. But even conserving his strength and breath and the way he said, slowing down the vital life processes. How long do you think he could live entombed in that war? I had to get to him. But when I walked by the bank hiding in the crowd so they, they wouldn't see me, I saw that there was a policeman there. They put a policeman there just to keep me out. I had to figure out some way to get in there. Tell Mr. Roth to keep alive that I was working to help him. I had to figure out a way. There's a store across the street. A store selling paint. That was the answer. Something for cleaning? Uh, of course, madam. Uh, how much do you think you'll need? Oh, I suggest a pint. Uh, we have it here in bulk. Open it? Sure, sure. Uh, see, it's standard cleaning fluid. That, uh, 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 lady, no. Uh, no, that match. Look out. Don't. Don't. It's inflammable. Don't. Help. Fire. Grab that woman. She said fire to the store. Fire. In a few moments, everyone was so busy that I was quite free to go into the bank. In a few seconds, my ear was against the wall. Mr. Roth, Mr. Roth, I, I'm back, I'm back. They, they tried to keep me away from me, but I'm back. Mr. Roth, can, can you hear me? Alive. Yes, still alive. Oh, Mr. Roth, what should I do? What? Yes, I will. I will. They won't stop me this time. Something. Get something and turn on the wall. Fire axe. Off the wall. Mr. Roth, look. Look. If you could see, I got a fire axe. Could they help you? Could they help you? Will you get out? We'll get you out. Yes, I will get you out. The mob is crossing, Mr. Roth. I will get to you. Get me out to you. No one will stop me now. I don't want to help you. But I'm helping you. Give me that axe. Oh. No, you won't stop me. I'll let the help Mr. Roth. Give me that axe. I'll give it to you. Oh. Lady, I'll what? I'll you have to stop me. I'll tell you have to stop me. You kill the police. No, no, I'll tell you. 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 I'll tell you.
and dead, decaying flesh and worms and the, the skull will talk to you and ask you, why didn't you help me? So I ask you again, please, please, won't you come to the bank? Seriously, now, what what did you think of that? You don't hear programs like that anymore. I mean, I've been watching this Black Mirror, which is a Netflix, and I guess that follows in the family of these shows. And I've, I've caught the first two shows of the latest season. And if you like this sort of thing, I heartily recommend Black Mirror. I don't want to spoil any of the material, but the opening show of the season really takes uh, AI and computer graphics to a whole new and very spooky and sinister end and uh, reality in and of itself. And uh, the the second episode, let's just say it's about a filmmaker who uh, things don't quite go as they thought they would when they go back to their hometown to visit mom. And, yeah, Arch Obler. We'll uh, certainly examine him more as this series goes on. I'm actually feeling like I'm leaning more towards this than the shorter episodes, but that's I, I am a moody guy, and that could very well change at any given moment. But continuing, as we are really getting towards, uh, well, we're getting towards, uh, what, three and a half hours of appreciation. Um, The the last one was four hours. I don't know, is that that, like already too long? Can we go eight hours? Who knows? But uh, the four-hour thing, a little more, a little less, seems to have a good feel. And in my head, four hours is a radio shift. Generally speaking, in my day at least, when you worked in radio, the morning guy works from 6 in the morning till 10 a.m. Then that middle guy who really, the 10 a.m. to 2 o'clock slot isn't considered a major slot. It's a daytime thing. And then, of course, your drive time, which is 2 to 6 And then after that, you go into night radio and so forth. So four hours, a little more, a little less, seems like what one would do if you were following that convention. You see, now we can defy convention and just kind of do whatever we're feeling. Another, uh, entertainment has changed so much. Everything is changing constantly and... At least minds like mine like to cling and compare. And some of this is good and some of it might be a little obsessive. Like Nietzsche says, you want to know history, but you don't want to fall into it, so to speak. But let's continue. Uh, I am a fan of professional wrestling and I don't really watch it or follow it anymore. Uh, the actual watching of the programs has lost whatever allure it had. However, I still like to listen to certain people who talk about professional wrestling, the history of it, the people, the events, and uh, sticking with our Christmas theme that we picked up earlier with Shambles Tapestry. In 2007, there was a match... Uh, on a professional wrestling company called TNA, which I think has changed its name to Impact Wrestling now. And two of my... I I like these guys. Brian and Vinny. They do the Brian and Vinny show on the Figure 4 Wrestling Observer 
channel and uh, it's a, not an expensive paid subscription and you can hear a lot of their stuff on YouTube and this is their review of a very special uh, Christmas match again from 2007 the infamous Silent Night Bloody Night match where were we Crystal interviewed Joe, who was mad. He was being pissy. She wanted him to go to the Christmas party, and he said instead of spending all that money on a Christmas party, they could spend it on his contract or the TV time on his matches. He told her to tell Matt Morgan he was going to appear at the party and make sure it was one he never forgot. And he was yelling and screaming and staring down Crystal and just a dick. And he's supposed to be Bailey. Yes, he's supposed to be the script. hero. According to the script, he's a hero. Why? <laughs> I know I shouldn't even say that word because you have peace with the why, <laughs> but like, why? Because they're fools. I think they're retarded. Well, yeah. Okay, so then we had best segment in history. <laughs> Which was the worst segment in history. Get this match. Ralph, Abyss, Black Rain, and the Shark Boy in a neck brace. What? <laughs> <laughs> it was like they had three guys. They said, no, we need a fourth. Who is closest to where I am standing right this second? You in the fish head. Come here. <laughs> so, yes, Shark Boy in the, okay, the match begins. Well, let's first off, what do we have in the ring? All right, there were four dudes standing around us in a circle. In the center of the circle, in the center of the ring, was a Christmas tree composed entirely of barbed wire and some chains in there and stuff. And uh, the Christmas tree... It wasn't just standing like any tree stand. It was suspended from the ceiling. Yes. It was hanging from a rope, just just barely touching the mat. And surrounded this barbed wire Christmas tree were packages, gifts. Sure. It was the holiday season after all. Now, <laughs> Brian skipped to the entrance, so it was not until like the very end I, I knew what this was. I thought this was just a... Barbed wire Christmas tree mesh. No. 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 So the gifts are open. The gifts are open. And between the barbed wire Christmas tree and the gifts, this was the Silent Night Bloody Night match. Yes. Now, the highlight of this match, there were a couple of highlights, both involving the tree, actually. Actually, but even, be but even before you get there. I don't know. The first one doesn't help. Go do the first one. With the tree? With Shark Boy? <laughs> Which one are you talking about? The... Bathing the heels, which was, as we, we must explain, <laughs> oh, yeah. red and black rain. They took poor Shark Boy, the X Division guy, the comedy geek, the dude in the neck brace. They took him to the corner, and they double teed him, these two gym men, and they whipped him into the barbed wire Christmas tree. <laughs> he fell down. This was such a violent, cruel, vicious attack that Shark Boy took a bump, <laughs> and the Christmas tree went flying through the air. Swinging back and forth. He bounced. He bounced off the barbed wire Christmas tree. Yes. Now, Brian, there's two of us in this room. <laughs> One of us has actually had a barter incident in his life. Didn't you once write a... Uh, I did, actually. You, you wrote a, as a young boy once, wrote a barb... Uh, I'll wrote a tell bike. this okay. story. Tell the story. I was on a hill. On a bike. On a, well, no, I was just on the hill. And my friend had a 10-speed. And he was like, you want to try riding my 10-speed? I was like, sure. I had, like, a Huffy, <laughs> those little bikes, you know what I mean? Absolutely. A little dirt bike. So I had never been on a 10-speed before or a fancy-ass bike like this. So I thought that when you get on a 10-speed and you start riding, you put on the brakes the same way you put the brakes on on a Huffy. You uh, push you backwards, backwards on the pedal. Sure. That stops it. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you were to learn. Oh, no, I was incorrect. The brake on a 10-speed is on the handle. I did not know that. I gained speed as I went down this hill, as we learned in physics class. E equals MC squared. I sped up and sped up and sped up. And at the bottom of the hill was a barbed wire fence. There was nothing I could do to stop. I was pedaling frantically in reverse to no avail. I thought that my friend had just chipped the chain off and attempted to kill me. And I fucking ran into the barbed wire fence with great fury. And I'll never forget that. Actually. Now, did you bounce? Oh, no. Did the barbed wire go flying? No. Did it puncture you? I thought that I may have been cut in about six pieces, actually, <laughs> and put back together in the hospital. I mean, we can laugh about this because you survived. I did survive. It sounds like it sucked. It did suck. Shark Boy was okay, though. <laughs> he was. Shark Boy bounced off the tree. This was where I started to giggle. 
<laughs> it got better with Relic. It got better, yes. Yeah, I, I didn't giggle, by the way. The, the match opened. Abyss and Black Rain started to brawl around ringside. Shark Boy and Relic stared at each other for a while and then began to slowly unwrap presents. <laughs> like a child on Christmas morn trying to build anticipation. So that didn't make me giggle. But when Shark Boy bounced off the barbed wire Christmas tree, <laughs> that was comedy. Okay, so the match continued. They were uh, trying to pin Shark Boy after he bounced off the tree. Are we getting to the relic part where he gets thrown into the tree? No, that's that's that is coming up here. Soon. Relic got whipped towards a tree, <laughs> and he just stopped running. <laughs> I, I'm not sure where that was. <laughs> there was so much stupidity here, I couldn't write it all he down. He just stopped running. He's put on the brakes, they said. Yeah. He's like, shit, a barbed wire tree. I'll just stop <laughs> running. I'll stop running. I'm no not one's sure. ever thought of that in history of wrestling before. <laughs> I'm not sure where that fit into the timeline here. There was a lot going on. So, Relic and, 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 and Black Rain, they had a chart with the mercy. One of them went for a pin, and the other pulled him off. <laughs> because every partner in every magic DNA must fight. Here's the question. Here's the question, okay? There were two men teaming up to beat on one man. They were working together to be victorious. However, the one man could not allow his partner to get the pin here in a match with nothing on the line. Right. So he, he did not accept defeat here in the silent night, bloody night except match. Defeat? Except he was his partner. Was it a tag team match? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> no. Now that I think about it, I have no earthly idea. Does this mean a biz and boy where he tagged him? It may have been a four away. We don't know. And apparently this win was very important to Black Rain. <laughs> sure, either way. He had an AW on his win loss record. Okay, so. <laughs> Wait, there is more. There is more. So Abyss walks over to the packages. He uh, selects one random, I guess. Or maybe Did we get the one where the, the Christmas tree got thrown that's in? Coming. That, that, that's coming. That's coming. That's coming. There is more. So Abyss walks over to the packages. He picks one at random, or perhaps there was a tag that said, To Abyss from Santa. <laughs> to Chris. To Chris. <laughs> to Chris from Santa. <laughs> so he unwraps it, and he takes it out. It's a baseball bat. Wrapped with barbed wire. He says, cool, and he turns around to use it. Now, the problem with this is, from underneath, he pulled this package out from underneath a tree composed entirely <laughs> of barbed wire. If you're going to hit someone, you would not hit them with a the bat. You would hit them with the tree, I would think. You would think. I would think this has many more sharp points. Now, granted, perhaps he watched Shark Boy bounce off it and think, hey, that wouldn't hurt at all. <laughs> perhaps he's capable of that higher thought. But I'm just saying, if you told me I could hit someone with a bat with barbed wire on it, or a tree that was, in fact, barbed wire, I'd go with the tree. So, seconds later, he got taxed. <laughs> he was not satisfied with the tree or the bat. He got taxed. And that, Brian, that right there is where I wrote down, this is the lowest point in impact history. <laughs> And then glass. And then there was so much more. And when the more happened, that's when I lost all control. This is where I began to laugh uncontrollably. I was so, so overwhelmed with bullshit after bullshit after wave of fucking bullshit, and I could take no more, and I could just and revel in it. This made me jolly. So, yes, Abyss got tax. Abyss got glass. Let's see. Did anyone end up going... tree! Okay, then, yes. So then there was the greatest spot I've ever seen all the time, all my life. Okay, so the tree's hanging, right? The tree's hanging in the ring. So Abyss and Shark Boy, who are now working together, they take Black Rain and wave him from one corner to the other. The tree is in the ring, though. This forces Black Rain to run in a circle. He must circum he must circumnavigate the tree. He must run in a loop over the other corner. <laughs> they, then take, they, take, they take Relic. They wave him in. And uh, apparently he was just following his buddy Black Rain's footsteps because he also went around the tree. Then he went into the corner. All right, so now, let me, let me reset the stage so I'm sure you're all having trouble visualizing this. So Black Rain is in the corner. Relic is in front of him also in the corner. The tree is hanging, <laughs> the tree. hanging in the center of the ring. <laughs> and Abyss and Shark Boy are, are, are on the other side. They then grab the tree, which is hanging. That's important. They pull it back to the opposite corner as far as it will go. So now it's hanging off the mat, and it's got some tension in it. Like a, you know, like a pendulum. 
They then release it, and it slowly swoops forward <laughs> and arcs down. I love, there's a lot of air in this Christmas tree. <laughs> there's a lot of air. It, it kind of lightly bumps off the mat. It keeps swinging. Relic, <laughs> Relic has time to avoid, and he runs for his life from the Tree of Doom. Now, you will recall that when Sharkboy was thrown into this tree, he bounced. <laughs> now, Black Rain did not bounce. The, or what should I say? The tree did not bounce off Black Rain. Why? <laughs> because he opened his arms wide. <laughs> and he gave the tree a great bear hug. <laughs> He clutched the tree <laughs> close to his chest and nuzzled it to ensure that it stuck him. I can't believe there's a tree made of barbed wire in this match. <laughs> and they had to fake poke it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so this year, so here's the... <laughs> so here's the He's in the corner. Stuck with a tree. He's holding on to the tree to mimic being stuck with it. Out comes Jim Mitchell. He did. Jim Mitchell came out. He was wearing a purple suit like the Joker. <laughs> this did not help my composure. <laughs> and he is looking at this. He's looking at this match with his rest in the streets. What is going on here? Like he was confounded by this, by these events. Okay. From here, I'm fuzzy. I admit. The lights go out. Mitchell got on the apron. I, I think there was a pin here that Mitchell distracted the ref from. Mitchell gets in the apron. The lights go out, and there was Judas Macias. Okay. Yeah, I, I, all I know, there, there's a few minutes of action here. I, was I will tell hard. you what happened. Here's what happened. The lights went out. Judas Macias appeared in the ring. He dropped a bit into the thumbtacks. No one cared, like we've never seen that one before. And then in the background, you see Relic pin Shark Boy with a jackhammer. He won! <laughs> he can start with a jackhammer. Yes. I was aware that he won. In the middle of the mat. <laughs> there was no tree involved. There was no barbed wire ma- uh, bat involved. There was no uh, packs or glass involved. He gave him a suplex and pinned him. <laughs> he pinned him with a wrestling hold. Oh, God. Yes, and this, by the way, they killed Relic's gimmick. <laughs> the one thing of TNA I always enjoyed, no, he won a match. <laughs> he won a match. This was so horrible. <laughs> There's just something about the make-believe world of professional wrestling and the way people can analyze it and look at it and become passionate about it, even though the entire thing, it's a theatrical, it's a dance, and it's a show, and yet it's somehow an athletic event. It's, it's just a very strange popular culture phenomenon, and that, that was just these guys and how both seriously and not seriously they're taking it at the same time because that's wrestling it's serious but it isn't serious but it is it's real but it's just a very strange art form and it's something i got a real kick out of i used to watch it religiously uh, as a kid somewhat but there was a time probably in the very late 90s into the early to mid 2000s and I, I was already an older guy i mean this isn't some kid and i, I went to the events and I, I think it was because my son was into it to a certain degree but that wouldn't dip. i really enjoyed it with or without his enjoyment and it, it guilty pleasure oh yes it's not it's totally lowbrow. It's like the comic book thing that I have. It's not, you can't even begin to extol virtues and call it a high art. It's a low art. It's uh, fun, I guess. Or at least at the time I was watching it. And now I still, but the Brian and Vinny things are all over YouTube. And I don't particularly care for listening to their reviews of contemporary programming, but when they go into the older wrestling, well, that's where I'm familiar with the characters and the personalities, maybe. I mean, a guy like Ric Flair. At some point in these, I really need to play you 
a bunch of what they call his promos, you know, when the wrestler comes out and talks, down talks his opponent and talks about how great he is and what he's going to do. And Ric Flair was, if not the best, one of the absolute best in the history of wrestling at doing that. And yeah, it just, we'll, we'll continue this conversation. But now we go back to Overnight Scape underground hosts uh we have rubinard now rubinard is an interesting one because he was doing this independent of the overnight scape underground and then joined us and he used to do programming i mean this in a show from what april 11th 2016 is already his 330 something show it's called the skimming episode and Another really fascinating personality who has shared his mind with us, and it's my privilege to share it with you. Uh, this evening we don't have a cicada, we have the sound of a... Well, I was about to say a ventilation fan, but then a taxi drove past. That's been another recurring theme on the program, is taxis who see pedestrians at certain times of night and just assume that if you're a pedestrian at night walking along the side of a road, you must want a taxi. And so they see you, and they slow right down, and they look at you. Whoa! The hell was that? And that guy may have just tried to do a bit of a burnout, and he failed. Yeah. <laughs> Dumbass. I know what's dumber, doing a burnout on a public street or even failing at it. Probably a bit of both. Bit of column A, a bit of column B. Bees. Bees. And then after they see you and they realize as the taxi driver that you don't require their services, they accelerate and fly away, blasting a exhaust and dust in your face, as if to say, well, damn it, you don't need me, well, screw you, and off they go. And it happens so often. People wonder why Uber is eating their lunch. I've had plenty of lovely ca- uh, cab drivers, to be honest about it, like, especially in Singapore, there are lots of really nice ones. I think I've talked about this before, but quite often you know, people give taxi drivers crap, but if you treat them like humans rather than a master-slave relationship, you know, you ask how their day's going, day's going, testy pop, and you actually get treated like a person back. And it's rather pleasant. Doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. Also had my fair share of negative experiences in taxis, as I think we all have. I think the the best one I ever had was one of the first taxis I ever took in Australia when I moved back here. the douchebag skimmed my credit card. Now, how do I know that he did it? Well, let me put it this way. When I moved back to Australia, I was concerned that for someone of my age, I didn't really have any credit history or previous job experience in Australia, which I've been told can be quite... can can make your life a bit difficult under certain circumstances. So uh, if this is the first time you've listened to the program, first of all, my condolences. There are plenty of better ones, but (laughs) if you're sticking around, hey, how are you doing? Um, I, so my sister and I grew up in Singapore as regular listeners are depressingly bored of hearing (laughs) hearing me talk about. It is, it's home though. Like I do kind of want to go back there one day. Seems like an increasingly distant dream, though, more than, the more that I think about it. Australia, to me, I think it will, in a way, it's kind of where I'm 
where I was from originally, sort of in the primordial ooze of the beginning of the universe and stuff, but it's not, it's not really home. It's, 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 you know, it's like there's, there's nothing rational about it, about all these feelings and stuff. But so, you know, I went to school in Singapore. I got my first jobs in Singapore. I even got some CPF in Singapore, which is, for my Australian listeners, that's the equivalent of our superannuation stuff here. You know, I developed a bit of history over there. And so when I came back to Australia, and they want, you know, you're applying for a job, and they want job experience, and they, um, you know, you, you want to apply for something, and they ask for various forms of ID and stuff. And I had to pretty much start from scratch. And I'd heard at some point that, you know, if I had decided to uh, purchase property in Australia anytime soon, and yes, I'm, I'm resisting all urges to just start cackling with laughter at the thought of someone buying property in Australia. There, there was a new report out, on, I think it was the Sydney Morning Herald, where they said now that 75% of Sydney is out of the reach of anyone who isn't in the top tax bracket. Now think about that for a second. 75% of dwellings, places that people live in, you can't buy them unless you're in the top tax bracket. No, I'm, I'm kind of sort of sitting in the middle somewhere, maybe a tiny bit above the middle. Which I'm not sh- I think? Something like that? I don't know. Ooh, some more cicadas. There's no way in hell that I could buy property. Just, it's just not going to happen. I, I did not think that I would be able to move away from a place, uh, move away from Singapore to a place that would have less affordable housing than Singapore. The difference is, Singapore has an excuse. The whole country is the size of Parramatta. <laughs> so, there are farms in the US that are bigger than Singapore. There are ranches, there are, you know, there, there are, there's, um, there are beef farms in Australia. That, I was about to say beef plantations, that doesn't really work. <laughs> That are beginning to think. Anyway, so my point is, though, if I decided in the future to get some big ticket items, things like that, even if I was going to buy a car or something, the theory was that it might be harder for me to do that because I don't have any credit history here. So I thought I would get myself a credit card. I dislike intensely the idea of having a credit card. And, you know, I've had them in the past. Um, and I found them kind of mildly useful, uh, you know, to before sort of debit cards with Visa and MasterCard appeared on them. I found them kind of useful. You can essentially charge a month's worth of stuff to them, and at the end of the month, you just pay them off in full. And now, well, th- this is <laughs> this is fascinating stuff. Um, I'm with a Bank West, which has a. Um, Oh, what is it? The Hero Transaction Account, which actually gives you a, well, by Australian standards, a decent chunk of interest, even just in a regular checking account. It's not that much lower than the, their air quotes high interest savings. So the point is, I will, I get paid, and I let the money sit in the account for the whole month doing nothing, and I put it on the credit card, and at the end of the month I pay it off in full. Is this what people who've turned thirty talk about? Good grief. <laughs> I'm so, I'm, oh, I t- this is the first episode since turning 30 and I feel old, even just at these topics and stuff. Oh, dear. What, what, have, I, what have I become? <laughs> oh. But so I'd got this credit card and I had never used it before. And then one evening... I needed to go, I think I was coming back from the data center all the way back up to Hornsby. And it was about four o'clock in the morning. 
It's not that far off that now, actually. And I thought, yeah, public transport's not available. Don't want to wake up any of my friends to sort of ask for a lift. And even if I was going to, mascot to Hornsby, because mascot's where the data centres are, that's, that, that's quite the trip. I'm not going to subject anyone to that. So I got a cab. Got a taxi. And I put it on the credit card so that it would be easy enough for me to expense afterwards, so you can get a receipt and stuff. And so it was, it was about four in the morning by the time I got home. And so alarm bells didn't ring when he swiped my card and then said that the card didn't work and that he was going to have to swipe it in a different machine. And so he, uh, excuse me, sorry, no, he didn't swipe it, he put, because it's a chip thing, so he put the, ch- the card chip first into this machine and then uh, did it again because that machine was broken. Now, normally in my sort of lucid state, I would have said, uh, it's not working. That's a bit, hmm, it's pretty obvious that he just copied the card right in front of my face. And he figured that uh, maybe I just looked really stoned. I, I was, I'm, I've been pretty tired lately, but those 4 a.m. data center trips were really brutal, particularly after you've been doing them for a few days at a time. And so maybe he figured that I looked stoned or something and that he'd be able to get away with taking my card. And so he did. And sure enough, within 24 hours, got a call from the credit card company from Bank West saying, oh yes, your your card has uh, been used to make a series of withdrawals from uh, places that you don't normally frequent. And sure enough, there were ones in transactions being done in suburbs. Well, in in fact, it was worse than that. It, It wasn't just suburbs I'd never been to before, but they'd done one in a suburb and then a suburb five minutes later in a place that was 100 k's away. Like, even if you had a private jet, you could not have got between those two ATMs in time. So presumably, I guess what happened is after the guy had a copy of my card, he copied it a whole bunch more times, gave them to his friends, and they hit all the ATMs at the same time before they could cancel the card. So they made out with, they basically maxed out my credit card with cash withdrawals. Shortly after that, I learned about how you could disable cash advances on a credit card. <laughs> oh. But it shows, like, the scary thing is, I decided to use my credit card for that, but I could have easily that night have used my bank card. And then they, I don't know, could they have emptied my bank account? And then it I don't know, do, do you, um, if something happens to your bank card and you lose money through the FPOS system or what have you, I don't think there's very strong protections on that, is there? Like, will they refund you for that? Because at least with my MasterCard or Visa or whatever it was, I was able to reverse the charges and get my money back, fortunately, because it was several grand. I mean, ugh. The scary thing was, though, that while that was happening, uh, and I had I'd maxed out this credit card, it took them more than a month to fix it. In fact, I think it was almost two months by the time I got the money back into that account. And I had to file a police report. Uh, Claire and I had to go to the police station in uh, Town Hall and file a police report about it. Uh, uh. Just some memories of all of that. Is, oh, this is, it makes you feel so vulnerable to think, wow, someone's kind of stolen from me, like it's stolen a piece of me. And it... Uh, There was nothing I could do about it. I suppose that's what it would feel like to be robbed in a house. I've been lucky that I've only ever been robbed in a house once. Um, In in Adelaide, actually, randomly. 
They stole a bunch of computer gear. Fortunately, I had insurance. That could have been nasty, but yeah, I don't know. It's um, that, those. That was basically my my main negative of a taxi ride in Singapore. Excuse me, in Sydney. Whereas I don't know how many cab rides I went to in Singapore, in Malaysia, Indonesia, and it's funny that. You listen to all of the travel advice and they say, oh, be careful getting into a taxi in Asia because they'll try and rip you off. And, oh, be careful of this, they're going to scam you. But it wasn't until I came back to Australia that I got scammed. Welcome to the Ruben Oates Show. I am your host, Ruben Shade, and let me tell you, it is always a pleasure not only to have your company, but etc., so forth, and all the formalities coming to you from uh, Mascot in Sydney, Australia. Got some more listener feedback to get to this week from some suspects, which you may have heard from before, but I will get to those after I cross the street. I'm not going to read these as I. Australia. That's one thing I do not do. I'm obsessed with my smartphone, but damn it, I never under any circumstances use my smartphone when I'm crossing the street. That just sounds like a recipe for disaster. Oh, the sprinklers are going off. What the hell kind of sound was that? That was a taxi. It sounded like there was a cat in it. All right, let's have a look here. On sug.com. I kind of feel bad. It was the first Overnightscape Central. The very first one since I started contributing last year that I missed an episode. And they were talking about the Rolling Stones as well. And I had this big topic lined up. Whoa, the sprinklers are really going strong. I was going to talk about uh, how Microsoft had used the uh, Start Me Up song in their promo ads for Windows 95. One of my earliest childhood memories. <laughs> I don't know if that, how much that speaks to my interests as a kid or how much of a loser I was. But yeah, I remember saving up all of my weekly allowances and pocket money to... go to Dick Smith or whatever it was and get a copy of Windows 95. And a year later, we were living in Singapore. And I still have that copy of Windows 95. It came on three and a half inch, three and a half inch floppies. Uh, it had a start menu. It wasn't until years later that I realized that Windows 95 sort of added the features that next step, which was Steve Jobs' thing, had had for sort of, I don't know, five years already, and even the classic Mac had had for 10 years already. Because <laughs> I, I really liked Windows 3.1 and Windows 3.0 with multimedia extensions from a nostalgic point of view, but they were pretty terrible OSs, actually, to, honestly. And they weren't even the best graphical shells for DOS, you know, I think... Um, I think the the uh, OS2 and Gem were actually much better. And then if you just needed to launch DOS programs, then Power Power Menu by Brown Bag Software was the best one. Anyway, I digress. On on Sug.com, let's have a look here. Uh, yeah, so I missed out on the last Overnight Skip Central, which was a real shame. I wanted to, I thought I'd you know start talking about the Start Me Up song, Rolling Stones, and then sort of tangentially discuss this pointless crap about Windows 95. Here we go. So, in response to Ruben Show 336, my last episode as a 20-year-old, let's uh, sit precariously close to the sprinkler here while we read these. <clears throat> here it's sort of three in the morning. Mark says, well, a happy birthday, Reuben. Thank you. And I've really enjoyed your commemorative week. Alas, I too remember 30. I too remember 30, I should say. A thousand years ago. 
but it seemed, it seemed to me that it was actually far better than I had feared it might be. Onward through the fog, Mark. Thank you very much. Yeah. So if, just, to, I've, I've only been a 30 year old for about four days now and already it's been bloody awful. <laughs> but that's just, you know, what, um, what's happening at work and stuff. Uh, so much. It's interesting just how, how short term we really think and just how your perceptions of things in a short term and suddenly you feel like you're in this absolute pit that you can't get out of. But then 15 minutes later, you're probably fine. And so the thing you just have to keep reminding yourself that it'll be better. Maybe even in half an hour or so, just stick through it. <laughs> What's that thing that Winston Churchill said? He said, if, you've, um, uh, if you're walking through hell, keep walking. <laughs> you don't want to stay there, right? That, that quote, Winston Churchill, has got me through a lot of stuff. And uh, hold on, the phone went to sleep again. Let's have a look. The other comment was from... The one, the only shambles constant saying, Happy birthday, Ruben! A day late, but still. The week of daily episodes turned out to be great listening. Thank you very much. Yeah, I ended up doing six. Six? Wow, these sprinklers, huh? I don't know if that just sounds like white noise or not. Yeah, those uh, week of, of shows was pretty fun. And I was... I, I got quite excited during the day thinking about what I'd be talking about that night. If, if the show notes and some of the post-production stuff were faster, I probably would do it more often. But I think... I, I think most of us have, have better things to do than to listen to me for half an hour every day. So I think for your sanity as much as mine, I, I think I, I won't make that a regular occurrence, so you don't need to worry about that. Mm. These, are, these are very fancy directional sprinklers. So they're shooting out on, if you imagine a square, they're shooting out of three sides, but not the fourth side. That doesn't make sense, because there's a tree right behind it. Wouldn't you want to be watering that as well? One of my newfound obsessions, because I'm... I used to be a boring 20-something, and now I'm a boring 30-year-old, <laughs> is I... I really like cactuses. Cactuses. I think they're very cute. You have a little cactus... desk cactus. So I've had one at work for... Um, a year or so before actually before then I had one and uh, we moved offices and uh, unfortunately he got dropped and he fell to the ground and broke and so he's, his little trunk thing snapped and he, uh, he died so I was, I was very sad about that my little, my little cactus friend so I, I got a new one now and he sits on my desk and he is growing really fast he used to be about the size of a tennis ball and now, sort of in shape and size, now he's probably the same width as a tennis ball but maybe almost twice the height and it's only been a few months. Might need to get a bigger um, pot for him at some point. Cactus. Well, they're really cute. And it means that I can go on a, um, a holiday or, you know, a, um, a trip away from work for a couple of weeks and... He'll be there, growing as usual. It's a great thing about cactuses. I wish people were like cactuses. You just tend to them and then leave them alone for a few weeks. <laughs> an introvert cactus. That's it. I kind of like that as an idea. I wish I was a cactus in that way. All you, needed, all you need to do is to give me some coffee every two or three weeks and I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. And then for my... So I just quickly just because this is kind of a inward facing narcissistic episode my birthday was a lot of fun um, my 30th I ended up I think we we went to the pub in the evening I had a very lovely it was I think it was called the yellow yak or fat yak but it was yellow one of these things uh, pale ale beer was sort of a, a local Aussie thing it was really nice a vegetarian nachos not, not, 
Pe- people in New South Wales call it nachos, but the rest of the people in the world, I think, call them nachos, so I'm not sure which one of those it is. And what else do we... Oh, yes, and uh, Elke actually got me... My sister got me a really good present. She, got, she bought me a few hours in a flight simulator, so an actual cockpit mock-up that you go and you sit down and you fly a 737-800. How many episodes of the Rubino show have we wandered around in the evening and a 737 has flown above our heads? Well, apparently I'll be flying one. So that's a lot of fun. And then to top that off, uh, my old man bought me a trip on a steam locomotive, one of the New South Wales Garretts. Uh, and I think that'll be, so that starts up in around Newcastle and comes back down to Sydney again. So in in a couple of weeks time, that is going to be amazing. If you ever get a chance, um, take a look, go and just go on Wikipedia or uh, Google or whatever your weapon of choice is. And why did I think of Fatboy Slim for a second? (laughs) Check out a new weapon. And the weapon of choice, yeah, you can vote with this, or you can vote with that, or you can vote with this, or you can vote with that, or you can vote with this, and you can vote with that, or you can vote with us, do or you can vote with this. <laughs> and people accused Fatboy Slim of being repetitive. Can you believe it? And they accused Fatboy Slim of being repetitive. Can you believe it? And they accused Fatboy Slim of being repetitive. Can you... I was about to say believe it, but I think I'll go with dig it. If you get a chance... Go on Google Images or a search engine that actually respects your privacy and do a search for Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, train. They're very strange. So if you imagine like a normal steam locomotive, you've got the driving wheels and the, uh, you know, the, the cylinder on top of that, which has got all the tubes that the steam rushes through to boil the water. The boiler, as they say. <laughs> And then you've got the cab behind that, and then you've got a tender. Well, imagine there's a tender on the front of the train and the back of the train. And so the boiler with the driving wheels is kind of sitting in the middle between these two tenders, right? But then you take it one step further in weirdness, move the driving wheels out from underneath the boiler and make two sets of them and put them underneath each of the tenders. So you've got a tender at the front full of water with driving wheels, you've got a tender at the back full of coal with driving wheels, and you've got the boiler suspended in between, sort of in mid-air, in between. And supposedly they were the, that was sort of the last major technological triumph of steam before it finally died. So they're they're just a marvel of engineering. And yeah, within a few years of them being introduced, they were uh, retired from service because of diesels. And for environmental reasons, it's probably for the best. But, oh, that's going to be amazing. So, yeah, other than that, and then basically just sat around and bummed. I cracked out a copy of SimCity 3000 Ultimus on a Windows 2000 VM, and I started making a city again. That was really fun. Yeah, so overall, my 30th was sort of a, a quiet, relaxing affair, which is pretty much exactly as what I wanted, so it was great. Mm, so... Yeah, I know, I know I've, uh, I've had sort of a few dozen people on Twitter wish me happy birthday and stuff, so I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. It's, um, it really meant a lot. And so now, now that I'm 30 and I already feel old, I'm fine with that now. I, when I was 20, thinking, oh, God, I'm almost 30. This is terrible. Now that I am 30, I was about to say I don't care, but mm, that's not really true. Oh... Uh... Mm-mm-mm. Good night, everybody. Yeah, he, he had a way of doing, has had, like he went anywhere. He has a way of doing this personable radio visit. And, uh, God, 30 years old, imagine. Well, I guess that's true no matter, once you reach a certain age, I mean, I guess when you're 10, 20 years old, that 
the, the human condition. The, we examine it so intensely and we never really get a grip on it, but we have this temporary grip that we feel we get anyhow. So uh, let's see some notes here. Uh, it's it's really fascinating hearing about Singapore. It's it's intriguing, and and his humility about everything. He's he's just got this easygoing, uh, not quite self deprecation. I I tend to self deprecate. He's just a guy. It, it, I like that. I can't do that. I'm I either sounding like I'm boasting and being some bigger-than-life PQ river, or I'm this humble, pathetic, self-deprecating Brett with no middle ground whatsoever. Um, banks and cards, and it, it, that's another thing. I, in my day, you know, only crazy people paid for everything with a card. You had cash and you used cash and you carried this huge wad of these papers that now it's it's cards. I even I have to concede it even though for years I had some sort of strange sick pride. Well, I guess it's just hey, I'm roughing it. I carry money. I don't know. It's it's a strange thing. And I think Americans cling to it a lot more than other countries do for whatever reason. We're proud of our money. It's not something like that. And at the walking podcasting, that's something I never quite got a handle on. I've tried it a few times over the years. Frank Edward Nora is a master of it. He calls it rampling. He's just off and running and in my head because you know when I'm walking I certainly have this incredible series of thoughts and random digressions and I often feel I should have brought something and talked it out but when I do I can't another facet of the human condition that Murphy's law factor that always kicks in and when I did uh uh, back pre Jimbo Overnight Scape Central. Jimbo took over the Overnight Scape Central. If you go into the archive and dig around for about a year, I believe the year of 2017, if I'm not right, I pod faded, so as they call it, and handed the reins over to Jimbo. And when he passed on, I took it back over and have done it ever since almost weekly, I that I've done anything this close to weekly for this many years as somebody who's a procrastinator and an incompleter. It's really interesting that for some reason I've managed to do that in some ways. And he, he was, Ruben was talking about the daily show thing. And yeah, uh, I was doing this appreciator show pretty close to daily at the beginning, but realizing and somehow feeling that people who listen want to keep up and you number them and they want to listen to one, two, three, four, five. And if they miss a few days, they're not going to go back to continue with episode 12. They're curious and they want to go back. So they try to catch up and it soon becomes this tangle and it's not like real radio, because back in the day, real radio, sure, you listen to a host or a program every day, and say you missed a few days. It just They were gone. They were just gone, and you moved on, and you continued if you liked the host, or you realized, oh, I haven't listened to him for a few days. Meh, fooey. But I... This, I think, is something... Well, I can't do one of these shows as of yet in a day. I suppose if I focused on doing the Appreciator Showcase, the big showcase, this program could be more frequent. But as often as I get one done, I think will suffice. And this urgency to do a daily show or a regular show, that's not really working. Because looking, I, I don't, 
I, and I pay little attention to the numbers that Frank sees at the overnight scape underground, but using my YouTube numbers at a gauge as a gauge, frequent shows don't necessarily mean people stick with it. And I'll put out a show and it's been out a day and it hardly has any at all. So that's, and the last uh, big appreciator showcase only has a few listens, but I guess to a stranger, which I am trying to find you, the stranger, and draw you into my web of chaos. Yeah, that that's really what I'm doing. Because I'm doing that, I a four-hour show is daunting. I If somebody new to me is available only in four-hour shows, I'm probably less apt to give it a try than, you know, 20-minute shows. I am almost certain, because of watching YouTubes so much over the past few years, I've managed to whittle my attention span down to about eight minutes, which is crazy. But having stretched your attention span and appreciating that you've given me all this time because we're heading towards four and a half hours... I will relinquish my hold on your uh, being and uh, leave you with the uh, standard but heartfelt set the controls for the heart of the fun.